Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter Twenty Six. Next morning, a fine mist covered the peninsula. The weather promised well, and the outline of the castle mound grew clearer each moment that Margaret watched it. Presently, she saw the keep and the sun painted the rubble gold and charged the white sky with blue. The shadow of the house gathered itself together and fell over the garden. A cat looked up at her window and mewed. Lastly, the river appeared, still holding the mists between its banks and its overhanging alders, and only visible as far as a hill, which cut off its upper reaches. Margaret was fascinated by Oniton. She had said that she loved it, but it was rather its romantic tension that held her the rounded druids of whom she had caught glimpses in her drive, the rivers hurrying down from them to England, the carelessly modelled masses of the lowered hills, thrilled her with poetry. The house was insignificant, but the prospect from it would be an eternal joy, and she thought of all the friends she would have to stop in it, and of the conversion of Henry himself to a rural life. Society, too, promised favourably. The rector of the parish had dined with them last night, and she found that he was a friend of her father's, and so knew what to find in her. She liked him. He would introduce her to the town. While on her other side, Sir James Bitter sat, repeating that she had only to give the word, and he would whip up the county families for twenty miles round. Whether Sir James, who was garden seeds, had promised what he could perform, she doubted, but so long as Henry mistook them for the county families when they did call, she was content. Charles and Albert Fussell now crossed the lawn. They were going for a morning dip, and a servant followed them with their bathing dresses. She had meant to take a stroll herself before breakfast, but saw that the day was still sacred to men, and amused herself by watching their contretemps. In the first place, the key of the bathing shed could not be found. Charles stood by the riverside with folded hands, tragical, while the servant shouted, and was misunderstood by another servant in the garden. Then came a difficulty about a springboard and soon three people were running backwards and forwards over the meadow, with orders and counter-orders and recriminations and apologies. If Margaret wanted to jump from a motor-car, she jumped. If Tibby thought paddling would benefit his ankles, he paddled. If a clerk desired adventure, he took a walk in the dark. But these athletes seemed paralyzed. They could not bathe without their appliances, though the morning sun was calling and the last mists were rising from the dimpling stream. Had they found the life of the body, after all? Could not the men whom they despised as milksops beat them, even on their own ground? She thought of the bathing arrangements as they should be in her day, no worrying of servants, no appliances, beyond good sense. Her reflections were disturbed by the quiet child, who had come out to speak to the cat, but was now watching her watch the men. She called, "'Good morning, dear,' a little sharply. Her voice spread consternation. Charles looked round, and though completely attired in indigo blue, vanished into the shed and was seen no more. "'Miss Wilcox is up,' the child whispered, and then became unintelligible. "'What's that?' It sounded like, "'Cut yoke, sack back. I can't hear. On the bed, tissue paper.' Gathering that the wedding dress was on view, and that a visit would be seemly, she went to Evie's room. All was hilarity here. Evie, in a petticoat, was dancing with one of the Anglo-Indian ladies, while the other was adoring yards of white satin. They screamed, they laughed, they sang, and the dog barked. Margaret screamed a little, too, but without conviction. She could not feel that a wedding was so funny. Perhaps something was missing in her equipment. Evie gasped, "'Dolly is a rotter not to be here! Oh, we would rag just then!' Then Margaret went down to breakfast. Henry was already installed. He ate slowly, and spoke little, and was, in Margaret's eyes, the only member of their party who dodged emotion successfully. She could not suppose him indifferent, either to the loss of his daughter, or to the presence of his future wife. Yet he dwelt intact, only issuing orders occasionally, orders that promoted the comfort of his guests. He inquired after her hand. He set her to pour out the coffee, and Mrs. Warrington to pour out the tea. When Evie came down there was a moment's awkwardness and both ladies rose to vacate their places. "'Burton,' called Henry, "'serve tea and coffee from the sideboard.' It wasn't genuine tact, but it was tact of a sort, the sort that is as useful as the genuine, and saves even more situations at board meetings. 
Henry treated a marriage like a funeral, item by item, never raising his eyes to the whole, and, Death, where is thy sting? Love, where is thy victory? one would exclaim at the close. After breakfast she claimed a few words with him. It was always best to approach him formally. She asked for the interview, because he was going on to shoot grouse to-morrow, and she was returning to Helen in town. "'Certainly, dear,' said he. "'Of course I have the time. What do you want?' "'Nothing.' "'I was afraid something had gone wrong.' "'No, I have nothing to say. But you may talk.' Glancing at his watch, he talked of the nasty curve at the lich-gate. She heard him with interest. Her surface could always respond to his without contempt, though all her deeper being might be yearning to help him. She had abandoned any plan of action. Love is the best, and the more she let herself love him, the more chance was there that he would set his soul in order. Such a moment as this, when they sat under fair weather by the walks of their future home, was so sweet to her, that its sweetness would surely pierce to him. Each lift of his eyes, each parting of the thatched lip from the clean-shaven, must prelude the tenderness that kills the monk and the beast at a single blow. Disappointed a hundred times, she still hoped. She loved him with too clear a vision to fear his cloudiness. Whether he droned trivialities, as to-day, or sprang kisses on her in the twilight, she could pardon him, she could respond. "'If there is this nasty curve,' she suggested, "'couldn't we walk to the church? Not, of course, you and Evie, but the rest of us might very well go on first, and that would mean fewer carriages.' "'One can't have ladies walking through the market square. The Fussels wouldn't like it. They were awfully particular at Charles's wedding. My—she—one of our party was anxious to walk, and certainly the church was just round the corner, and I shouldn't have minded, but the Colonel made a great point of it.' "'You men shouldn't be so chivalrous,' said Margaret thoughtfully. "'Why not?' She knew why not, but said that she did not know. He then announced that unless she had anything special to say, he must visit the wine-cellar, and they went off together in search of Burton. Though clumsy and a little inconvenient, Oniton was a genuine country house. They clattered down flagged passages, looked into room after room, and scaring unknown maids from the performance of obscure duties— the wedding breakfast must be in readiness when they came back from church, and tea would be served in the garden. The sight of so many agitated and serious people made Margaret smile, but she reflected that they were paid to be serious, and enjoyed being agitated. Here were the lower wheels of the machine that was tossing Evie up into nuptial glory. A little boy blocked their way with pigtails. His mind could not grasp their greatness, and he said, "'Boy, you leave. Let me pass, please.' Henry asked him where Burton was, but the servants were so new that they did not know one another's names. In the still-room sat the band, who had stipulated for champagne as part of their fee, and who were already drinking beer. Scents of Araby came from the kitchen, mingled with cries. Margaret knew what had happened there, for it happened at Wickham Place. One of the wedding dishes had boiled over, and the cook was throwing cedar shavings to hide the smell. At last they came upon the butler. Henry gave him the keys— and handed Margaret down the cellar stairs. Two doors were unlocked. She, who kept all her wine at the bottom of the linen cupboard, was astonished at the sight. "'We shall never get through it!' she cried, and the two men were suddenly drawn into brotherhood, and exchanged smiles. She felt as if she had again jumped out of the car while it was moving. Certainly Oniton would take some digesting. It would be no small business to remain herself, and yet to assimilate such an establishment— she must remain herself, for his sake as well as her own, since a shadowy wife degrades the husband whom she accompanies, and she must assimilate for reasons of common honesty, since she had no right to marry a man and make him uncomfortable. Her only ally was the power of home. The loss of Wickham Place had taught her more than its possession. Howard's end had repeated the lesson. She was determined to create new sanctities among these hills. After visiting the wine-cellar, she dressed— and then came the wedding, which seemed a small affair when compared with the preparations for it. Everything went like one o'clock. Mr. Cahill materialized out of space, and was waiting for his bride at the church door. No one dropped the ring, or mispronounced the responses, or trod on Evie's train, or cried. In a few minutes the clergymen performed their duty, the register was signed, and they were back in their carriages, negotiating the dangerous curve by the lich-gate. Margaret was convinced that they had not been married at all, 
and that the Norman church had been intent all the time on other business. There were more documents to sign at the house, and the breakfast to eat, and then a few more people dropped in for the garden party. There had been a great many refusals, and after all it was not a very big affair, not as big as Margaret's would be. She noted the dishes and the strips of red carpet, that outwardly she might give Henry what was proper. But inwardly she hoped for something better than this blend of Sunday church and fox-hunting. If only someone had been upset! But this wedding had gone off so particularly well. Quite like a derbaugh, in the opinion of Lady Edser, and she thoroughly agreed with her. So the wasted day lumbered forward. The bride and bridegroom drove off, yelling with laughter, and for the second time the sun retreated towards the hills of Wales. Henry, who was more tired than he owned, came up to her in the castle meadow, and in tones of unusual softness, said that he was pleased. Everything had gone off so well. She felt that he was praising her, too, and blushed. Certainly she had done all she could with his intractable friends, and had made a special point of kowtowing to the men. They were breaking camp this evening. Only the Warringtons and quiet child would stay the night, and the others were already moving towards the house to finish their packing. "'I think it did go off well,' she agreed. "'Since I had to jump out of the motor, I'm thankful I lighted on my left hand. I am so very glad about it, Henry, dear. I only hope that the guests at ours may be half as comfortable. You must all remember that we have no practical person among us, except my aunt, and she is not used to entertainments on a large scale.' "'I know,' he said gravely. "'Under the circumstances, it would be better to put everything into the hands of Harrods, or Whiteley's, or even go to some hotel.' "'You desire a hotel?' "'Yes, because—well, I mustn't interfere with you. No doubt you want to be married from your old home.' "'My old home's falling into pieces, Henry. I only want my new. Isn't it a perfect evening?' "'The Alexandrina isn't bad.' The Alexandrina, she echoed, more occupied with the threads of smoke that were issuing from their chimneys, and ruling the sunlit slopes with parallels of grey. It's off Curzon Street. Is it? Let's be married from off Curzon Street. Then she turned westward to gaze at the swirling gold. Just where the river rounded the hill the sun caught it. Fairyland must lie above the bend, and its precious liquid was pouring towards them past Charles's bathing shed. She gazed so long that her eyes were dazzled, and when they moved back to the house, she could not recognize the faces of people who were coming out of it. A parlor-maid was preceding them. "'Who are those people?' she asked. "'They're callers,' exclaimed Henry. "'It's too late for callers.' "'Perhaps they're town people who want to see the wedding presents.' "'I'm not at home yet to townies.' "'Well, hide among the ruins, and if I can stop them, I will.' He thanked her. Margaret went forward, smiling socially. She supposed that these were unpunctual guests, who would have to be content with vicarious civility, since Evie and Charles were gone, Henry tired, and the others in their rooms. She assumed the airs of a hostess. Not for long. For one of the group was Helen. Helen in her oldest clothes, and dominated by that tense, wounding excitement that had made her a terror in their nursery days. "'What is it?' she called. "'Oh, what's wrong?' Is Tibby ill? Helen spoke to her two companions, who fell back. Then she bore forward furiously. They're starving! she shouted. I found them starving! Who? Why have you come? The basts! Oh, Helen! moaned Margaret. Whatever have you done now? He has lost his place. He has been turned out of his bank. Yes, he's done for. We upper classes have ruined him, and I suppose you'll tell me it's the battle of life. Starving! His wife is ill! Starving! She fainted in the train! Helen, are you mad? Perhaps. Yes, if you like, I'm mad. But I've brought them. I'll stand in justice no longer. I'll show up the wretchedness that lies under this luxury, this talk of impersonal forces, this cant about God doing what we're too slack to do ourselves. Have you actually brought two starving people from London to Shropshire, Helen?" Helen was checked. She had not thought of this, and her hysteria abated. "'There was a restaurant car on the train,' she said. "'Don't be absurd. They aren't starving, and you know it. Now begin from the beginning. I won't have such theatrical nonsense. How dare you! Yes, how dare you!' she repeated, as anger filled her. "'Bursting into Evie's wedding in this heartless way!' 
"'My goodness, but you've a perverted notion of philanthropy. "'Look,' she indicated the house, "'servants, people out of the windows. "'They think it's some vulgar scandal, and I must explain. "'Oh, no, it's only my sister screaming, and only two hangers-on of ours, "'whom she has brought here for no conceivable reason.' "'Kindly take back that word, hangers-on,' said Helen, ominously calm. "'Very well,' conceded Margaret, who for all her wrath was determined to avoid a real quarrel. "'I, too, am sorry about them. But it beats me why you've brought them here, or why you're here yourself. It's our last chance of seeing Mr. Wilcox.' Margaret moved towards the house at this. She was determined not to worry Henry. "'He's going to Scotland. I know he is. I insist on seeing him.' "'Yes, to-morrow. I knew it was our last chance.' "'How do you do, Mr. Bast?' said Margaret, trying to control her voice. "'This is an odd business. What view do you take of it?' "'There is Mrs. Bast, too,' prompted Helen. Jackie also shook hands. She, like her husband, was shy, and furthermore ill, and furthermore so bestially stupid that she could not grasp what was happening. She only knew that the lady had swept down like a whirlwind last night— had paid the rent, redeemed the furniture, provided them with a dinner and breakfast, and ordered them to meet her at Paddington next morning. Leonard had feebly protested, and when the morning came had suggested that they shouldn't go. But she, half mesmerized, had obeyed. The lady had told them to, and they must, and their bed-sitting-room had accordingly changed into Paddington, and Paddington into a railway carriage that shook and grew hot and grew cold, and vanished entirely, and reappeared amid torrents of expensive scent. "'You have fainted,' said the lady, in an awestruck voice. "'Perhaps the air would do you good.' And perhaps it had, for here she was, feeling rather better among a lot of flowers. "'I am sure I don't want to intrude,' began Leonard, in answer to Margaret's question. "'But you have been so kind to me in the past, in warning me about the Porphyrian, that I wondered—why, I wondered whether—' "'Whether we could get him back into the Porphyrian again,' supplied Helen. "'Meg, this has been a cheerful business. A bright evening's work that was on Chelsea Embankment.' Margaret shook her head and returned to Mr. Bast. "'I don't understand. You left the Porphyrian because we suggested it was a bad concern, didn't you?' "'That's right.' "'And went into a bank instead?' "'I told you all that,' said Helen. "'And they reduced their staff after he had been in a month, and now he's penniless, and I consider that we and our informant are directly to blame.' "'I hate all this,' Leonard muttered. "'I hope you do, Mr. Burst. But it's no good mincing matters. You have done yourself no good by coming here. If you intend to confront Mr. Wilcox, and to call him to account for a chance remark, you will make a very great mistake.' "'I brought them. I did it all!' cried Helen. "'I can only advise you to go at once. My sister has put you in a false position. And it is kindest to tell you so.' It's too late to get to town, but you'll find a comfortable hotel in Oniton, where Mrs. Bast can rest, and I hope you'll be my guests there. "'That isn't what I want, Miss Schlegel,' said Leonard. "'You're very kind, and no doubt it's a false position, but you make me miserable. I seem no good at all.' "'It's work he wants,' interpreted Helen. "'Can't you see?' Then he said, "'Jackie, let's go. We're more bother than we're worth.' costing these ladies pounds and pounds already to get work for us, and they never will. There's nothing we're good enough to do." "'We would like to find you work,' said Margaret, rather conventionally. "'We want to. I, like my sister. You're only down in your luck. Go to the hotel, have a good night's rest, and some day you shall pay me back the bill, if you prefer it.' But Leonard was near the abyss, and at such moments men see clearly. "'You don't know what you're talking about.' he said. I shall never get work now. If rich people fail at one profession, they can try another. Not I. I had my groove, and I've got out of it. I could do one particular branch of insurance in one particular office well enough to command a salary, but that's all. Poetry's nothing, Miss Schlegel. One's thoughts about this and that are nothing. Your money, too, is nothing, if you'll understand me. I mean, if a man over twenty once loses his own particular job, it's all over with him. I have seen it happen to others. The friends gave them money for a little, but in the end they fall over the edge. It's no good. It's a whole world pulling. There will always be rich and poor." He ceased. "'Won't you have something to eat?' said Margaret. 
I don't know what to do. It isn't my house, and though Mr. Wilcox would have been glad to see you at any other time, as I say, I don't know what to do, but I undertake to do what I can for you. Helen, offer them something. Do try a sandwich, Mrs. Bast. They moved to a long table behind which a servant was still standing. Iced cakes, sandwiches, innumerable. Coffee, claret cup, champagne remained almost intact. Their overfed guests could do no more. Leonard refused. Jackie thought she could manage a little. Margaret left them whispering together and had a few more words with Helen. She said, "'Helen, I like Mr. Bast. I agree that he's worth helping. I agree that we are directly responsible.' "'No, indirectly, via Mr. Wilcox. Let me tell you once for all that if you take up that attitude, I'll do nothing. No doubt you're right, logically, and are entitled to say a great many scathing things about Henry. Only I won't have it, so choose.' Helen looked at the sunset. "'If you promise to take them quietly to the George, I will speak to Henry about them, in my own way, mind. There is to be none of this absurd screaming about justice. I have no use for justice. If it was only a question of money, we could do it ourselves. But he wants work, and that we can't give him. But possibly Henry can. "'It's his duty to,' grumbled Helen. "'Nor am I concerned with duty.' I'm concerned with the characters of various people whom we know, and how, things being as they are, things may be made a little better. Mr. Wilcox hates being asked favours. All business men do. But I am going to ask him, at the risk of a rebuff, because I want to make things a little better. Very well. I promise. You take it very calmly. Take them off to the George, then, and I'll try. Poor creatures! But they look tired. As they parted, she added, "'I haven't nearly done with you, though, Helen. You have been most self-indulgent. I can't get over it. You have less restraint rather than more as you grow older. Think it over, and alter yourself, or we shan't have happy lives.' She rejoined Henry. Fortunately, he had been sitting down. These physical matters were important. "'Was it Townies?' he asked, greeting her with a pleasant smile. "'You'll never believe me.' said Margaret, sitting down beside him. "'It's all right now, but it was my sister.' "'Helen here!' he cried, preparing to rise. "'But she refused the invitation. I thought she despised weddings.' "'Don't get up. She has not come to the wedding. I've bundled her off to the George.' Inherently hospitable, he protested. "'No, she has two of her protégé with her, and must keep with them.' "'Let them all come.' "'My dear Henry, did you see them?' I did catch sight of a brown bunch of a woman, certainly. <laughs> the brown bunch was Helen. But did you catch sight of a sea-green and salmon bunch? What? Are they out bean-feasting? No, business. They want to see me, and later on I want to talk to you about them. She was ashamed of her own diplomacy. In dealing with a Wilcox, how tempting it was to lapse from comradeship, and to give him the kind of woman that he desired. Henry took the hint at once, and said— why later on? Tell me now. No time like the present. Shall I? If it isn't a long story. Oh, not five minutes. But there's a sting at the end of it, for I want you to find the man some work in your office. What are his qualifications? I don't know. He's a clerk. How old? Twenty-five, perhaps. What's his name? Bast said Margaret, and was about to remind him that they had met at Wickham Place, but stopped herself. It had not been a successful meeting. "'Where was he before?' Dempster's Bank. "'Why did he leave?' he asked, still remembering nothing. They reduced their staff. "'All right. I'll see him.' It was the reward of her tact and devotion through the day. Now she understood why some women prefer influence to rights. Mrs. Plinlimmon, when condemning suffragettes, had said— the woman who can't influence her husband to vote the way she wants ought to be ashamed of herself. Margaret had winced, but she was influencing Henry now, and though pleased at her little victory, she knew that she had won it by the methods of the harem. "'I should be glad if you took him,' she said, "'but I don't know whether he's qualified. "'I'll do what I can. But, Margaret, this mustn't be taken as a precedent.' "'No, of course, of course. I can't fit in your protégé every day. Business would suffer. I can promise you he's the last. He—he's rather a special case. 
protégés always are. She let it stand at that. He rose with a little extra touch of complacency, and held out his hand to help her up. How wide the gulf between Henry as he was, and Henry as Helen thought he ought to be! And she herself, hovering as usual between the two, now accepting men as they are, now yearning with her sister for truth. Love and truth, their warfare seems eternal. Perhaps the whole visible world rests on it, and if they were one, life itself, like the spirits when Prospero was reconciled to his brother, might vanish into air, into thin air. "'Your protégé has made us late,' said he. "'The fussels will just be starting.' On the whole she sided with men as they are. Henry would save the basts as he had saved Howard's end, while Helen and her friends were discussing the ethics of salvation. His was a slapdash method, but the world has been built slapdash, and the beauty of mountain and river and sunset may be but the varnish with which the unskilled artificer hides his joins. Oniton, like herself, was imperfect. Its apple-trees were stunted, its castle ruinous. It, too, had suffered in the border warfare between the Anglo-Saxon and the Celt, between things as they are and as they ought to be. Once more the West was retreating, once again the orderly stars were dotting the eastern sky. There is certainly no rest for us on the earth. But there is happiness, and as Margaret ascended the mound on her lover's arm, she felt that she was having her share. To her annoyance Mrs. Bast was still in the garden. The husband and Helen had left her there to finish her meal while they went to engage rooms. Margaret found this woman repellent. She had felt, when shaking her hand, an overpowering shame. She remembered the motive of her call at Wickham Place, and smelt again odours from the abyss, odours the more disturbing because they were involuntary. For there was no malice in Jackie. There she sat, a piece of cake in one hand, an empty champagne-glass in the other, doing no harm to anybody. "'She's overtired,' Margaret whispered. "'She's something else,' said Henry. "'This won't do. I can't have her in my garden in the state.' "'Is she?' Margaret hesitated to add, drunk. Now that she was going to marry him, he had grown particular. He discountenanced risqué conversations now. Henry went up to the woman. She raised her face, which gleamed in the twilight like a puff-ball. "'Madam, you will be more comfortable in the hotel,' he said sharply. Jackie replied, "'If it isn't Hen!' "'Ne crois pas que le mari lui ressemble,' apologized Margaret. "'Il est tout à fait différent.' "'Henry!' she repeated, quite distinctly. Mr. Wilcox was much annoyed. "'I can't congratulate you on your protégés.' he remarked. "'Anne, don't go. You do love me, dear, don't you?' "'Bless us, what a person!' sighed Margaret, gathering up her skirts. Jackie pointed with her cake. "'You're a nice boy, you are,' she yawned. "'There, now, I love you.' "'Henry, I am awfully sorry.' "'And pray why?' he asked, and looked at her so sternly that she feared he was ill. He seemed more scandalized than the facts demanded." to have brought this down on you. Pray don't apologize. The voice continued. Why does she call you Hen? said Margaret innocently. Has she ever seen you before? Seen Hen before? said Jackie. Who hasn't seen Hen? E servin' you like me, my dear. These boys. You wait. Still we love em. Are you now satisfied? Henry asked. Margaret began to grow frightened. "'I don't know what it is all about,' she said. "'Let's come in.' But he thought she was acting. He thought he was trapped. He saw his whole life crumbling. "'Don't you indeed?' he said bitingly. "'I do. Allow me to congratulate you on the success of your plan.' "'This is Helen's plan, not mine. I now understand your interest in the Basts. Very well thought out. I am amused at your caution, Margaret. You are quite right. It was necessary.' I am a man, and have lived a man's past. I have the honour to release you from your engagement." Still she could not understand. She knew of life's seamy side as a theory. She could not grasp it as a fact. More words from Jackie were necessary, words unequivocal, undenied. "'So that!' burst from her, and she went indoors. She stopped herself from saying more. "'So what?' asked Colonel Fessel, who was getting ready to start in the hall. We were saying, Henry and I were just having the fastest argument, my point being—' Seizing his fur coat from a footman, she offered to help him on. 
He protested, and there was a playful little scene. "'No, let me do that,' said Henry, following. "'Thanks so much. You see, he has forgiven me.' The Colonel said gallantly, "'I don't expect there's much to forgive.' He got into the car. The ladies followed him after an interval. Maids, courier, and heavier luggage had been sent on earlier by the branch line. Still chattering, still thanking their host and patronizing their future hostess, the guests were home away. Then Margaret continued, "'So that woman has been your mistress?' "'You put it with your usual delicacy,' he replied. "'When, please?' "'Why? When, please?' Ten years ago.' She left him without a word. For it was not her tragedy. It was Mrs. Wilcox's. End of chapter 26 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 27 Helen began to wonder why she had spent a matter of eight pounds in making some people ill and others angry. Now that the wave of excitement was ebbing, and had left her, Mr. Bast, and Mrs. Bast stranded for the night in a Shropshire hotel, she asked herself what forces had made the wave flow. At all events, no harm was done. Margaret would play the game properly now, and though Helen disapproved of her sister's methods, she knew that the Basts would benefit by them in the long run. "'Mr. Wilcox is so illogical,' she explained to Leonard, who had put his wife to bed, and was sitting with her in the empty coffee-room. "'If we told him it was his duty to take you on, he might refuse to do it. The fact is, he isn't properly educated. I don't want to set you against him, but you'll find him a trial.' "'I can never thank you sufficiently, Miss Schlegel,' was all that Leonard felt equal to. "'I believe in personal responsibility. Don't you? And in personal everything. I hate—I suppose I oughtn't to say that. But the Wilcoxes are on the wrong tack, surely. Or perhaps it isn't their fault. Perhaps the little thing that says I is missing out of the middle of their heads, and then it's a waste of time to blame them. There's a nightmare of a theory that says a special race is being born, which will rule the rest of us in the future, just because it lacks the little thing that says I. Had you heard that? I get no time for reading. Had you thought it, then? That there are two kinds of people. Our kind, who live straight from the middle of their heads, and the other kind, who can't, because their heads have no middle. They can't say I. They aren't, in fact, and so they're supermen. Pierpont Morgan has never said I in his life. Leonard roused himself. If his benefactress wanted intellectual conversation, she must have it. She was more important than his ruined past. "'I never got on to Nietzsche,' he said. "'But I always understood that those supermen were rather what you may call egoists.' "'Oh, no, that's wrong,' replied Helen. "'No superman ever said, I want, because I want must lead to the question, Who am I? And so to pity and to justice.' He only says want. Want Europe, if he's Napoleon. Want wives, if he's Bluebeard. Want Botticelli, if he's Pierpont Morgan. Never the eye. And if you could pierce through him, you'd find panic and emptiness in the middle. Leonard was silent for a moment. Then he said, May I take it, Miss Schlegel, that you and I are both the sort that say I? Of course. And your sister, too? "'Of course,' repeated Helen, a little sharply. She was annoyed with Margaret, but did not want her disgust. "'All presentable people say I.' "'But Mr. Wilcox, he is not, perhaps. I don't know that it's any good discussing Mr. Wilcox, either.' "'Quite so, quite so,' he agreed. Helen asked herself why she had snubbed him. Once or twice during the day she had encouraged him to criticize, and then had pulled him up short. Was she afraid of him presuming? If so, it was disgusting of her. But he was thinking the snub quite natural. Everything she did was natural, and incapable of causing offense. While the Mischlegels were together, he had felt them scarcely human, a sort of admonitory whirligig. But a Mischlegel alone was different. 
she was in Helen's case unmarried, in Margaret's about to be married, in neither case an echo of her sister. A light had fallen at last into this rich upper world, and he saw that it was full of men and women, some of whom were more friendly to him than others. Helen had become his Miss Schlegel, who scolded him and corresponded with him, and had swept down yesterday with grateful vehemence. Margaret, though not unkind, was severe and remote. He would not presume to help her, for instance. He had never liked her, and began to think that his original impression was true, and that her sister did not like her either. Helen was certainly lonely. She, who gave away so much, was receiving too little. Leonard was pleased to think that he could spare her vexation by holding his tongue, and concealing what he knew about Mr. Wilcox. Jackie had announced her discovery when he fetched her from the lawn. After the first shock, he did not mind for himself. By now he had no illusions about his wife, and this was only one new stain on the face of a love that had never been pure. To keep perfection perfect, that should be his ideal, if the future gave him time to have ideals. Helen— and Margaret, for Helen's sake, must not know. Helen disconcerted him by turning the conversation to his wife. "'Mrs. Bast, does she ever say I?' she asked, half mischievously, and then, "'Is she very tired?' "'It's better she stops in her room,' said Leonard. "'Shall I sit up with her?' "'No, thank you. She does not need company.' "'Mr. Bast, what kind of woman is your wife?" Leonard blushed up to his eyes. "'He ought to know my ways by now. Does that question offend you?' "'No. Oh, no, Miss Schlegel. No.' "'Because I love honesty. Don't pretend your marriage has been a happy one. You and she can have nothing in common.' He did not deny it, but said shyly, "'I suppose that's pretty obvious. But Jackie never meant to do anybody any harm. When things went wrong, or I heard things, I used to think it was her fault, but, looking back, it's more mine. I needn't have married her, but as I have, I must stick to her and keep her. How long have you been married? Nearly three years. What did your people say? They will not have anything to do with us. They had a sort of family council when they heard I was married— and cut us off altogether." Helen began to pace up and down the room. "'My good boy, what a mess!' she said gently. "'Who are your people?' He could answer this. His parents, who were dead, had been in trade. His sisters had married commercial travellers. His brother was a lay-reader. "'And your grandparents?' Leonard told her a secret that he had held shameful up to now. "'They were just nothing at all he said. Agricultural labourers and that sort. So, from which part? Lincolnshire, mostly, but my mother's father, he, oddly enough, came from these parts round here. From this very Shropshire? Yes, that is odd. My mother's people were Lancashire. But why do your brother and your sisters object to Mrs. Bast? Oh, I don't know. Excuse me, you do know. I am not a baby. I can bear anything you tell me, and the more you tell, the more I shall be able to help. Have they heard anything against her?" He was silent. "'I think I have guessed now,' said Helen, very gravely. "'I don't think so, Miss Schlegel. I hope not.' "'We must be honest, even over these things. I have guessed. I am frightfully dreadfully sorry, but it does not make the least difference to me. I shall feel just the same to both of you. I blame not your wife for these things, but men." Leonard left it at that, so long as she did not guess the man. She stood at the window and slowly pulled up the blinds. The hotel looked over a dark square. The mists had begun. When she turned back to him, her eyes were shining. "'Don't you worry,' he pleaded. I can't bear that. We shall be all right if I get work. If I could only get work, something regular to do, then it wouldn't be so bad again. I don't trouble after books as I used. I can imagine that with regular work we should settle down again. It stops one thinking. Settle down to what? 
Oh, just settle down. And that's to be life, said Helen, with a catch in her throat. How can you, with all the beautiful things to see and do, with music, with walking at night— Walking is well enough when a man's in work, he answered. Oh, I did talk a lot of nonsense once, but there's nothing like a bailiff in the house to drive it out of you. When I saw him fingering my Ruskins and Stevensons, I seemed to see life straight real, and it isn't a pretty sight. My books are back again, thanks to you, but they'll never be the same to me again, and I shan't ever again think night in the woods is wonderful. Why not? asked Helen, throwing up the window. Because I see one must have money. Well, you're wrong. I wish I was wrong. But the clergyman, he has money of his own, or else he's paid. The poet or the musician does the same. The tramp, he's no different. The tramp goes to the workhouse in the end, and is paid for with other people's money. Miss Schlegel, the real thing's money, and all the rest is a dream. You're still wrong. You've forgotten death. Leonard could not understand. If we lived for ever, what you say would be true. But we have to die. We have to leave life presently. Injustice and greed would be the real thing if we lived for ever. As it is, we must hold to other things, because death is coming. I love death. Not morbidly, but because he explains. He shows me the emptiness of money. Death and money are the eternal foes, not death and life. Never mind what lies behind death, Mr. Bast, but be sure that the poet and the musician and the tramp will be happier in it than the man who has never learnt to say, I am I. I wonder. We are all in a mist. I know, but I can help you this far. Men like the Wilcoxes are deeper in the mist than any. Sane, sound Englishmen! building up empires, levelling all the world into what they call common sense. But mention death to them, and they're offended, because death's really imperial, and he cries out against them for ever. I am as afraid of death as any one. But not of the idea of death. But what is the difference? Infinite difference, said Helen, more gravely than before. Leonard looked at her, wondering— and had the sense of great things sweeping out of the shrouded night. But he could not receive them, because his heart was still full of little things. As the lost umbrella had spoilt the concert at Queen's Hall, so the lost situation was obscuring the diviner harmonies now. Death, life, and materialism were fine words, but would Mr. Wilcox take him on as a clerk? Talk as one would, Mr. Wilcox was king of this world, the superman, with his own morality, whose head remained in the clouds. "'I must be stupid,' he said apologetically. While to Helen the paradox became clearer and clearer. Death destroys a man. The idea of death saves him. Behind the coffins and the skeletons that stay the vulgar mind lies something so immense that all that is great in us responds to it. Men of the world may recoil from the charnel-house that they will one day enter, but love knows better. Death is his foe, but his peer, and in their age-long struggle the thews of love have been strengthened, and his vision cleared, until there is no one who can stand against him. So never give in, continued the girl, and restated again and again the vague yet convincing plea that the invisible lodges against the visible. Her excitement grew as she tried to cut the rope that fastened Leonard to the earth. Woven of bitter experience, it resisted her. Presently the waitress entered, and gave her a letter from Margaret. Another note, addressed to Leonard, was inside. They read them, listening to the murmurings of the river. End of chapter 27 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 28 For many hours Margaret did nothing. Then she controlled herself and wrote some letters. She was too bruised to speak to Henry. She could pity him, and even determined to marry him. But as yet all lay too deep in her heart for speech. On the surface the sense of his degradation was too strong. She could not command voice or look, 
and the gentle words that she forced out through her pen seemed to proceed from some other person. "'My dearest boy,' she began, "'this is not to part us. It is everything or nothing, and I mean it to be nothing. It happened long before we ever met, and even if it had happened since, I should be writing the same, I hope. I do understand.' But she crossed out, I do understand. It struck a false note. Henry could not bear to be understood. She also crossed out, it is everything or nothing. Henry would resent so strong a grasp of the situation. She must not comment. Comment is unfeminine. I think that'll about do, she thought. Then the sense of his degradation choked her. Was he worth all this bother? To have yielded to a woman of that sort was everything. Yes, it was, and she could not be his wife. She tried to translate his temptation into her own language, and her brain reeled. Men must be different, even to want to yield to such a temptation. Her belief in comradeship was stifled, and she saw life as from that glass saloon on the Great Western, which sheltered male and female alike from the fresh air. Are the sexes really races? each with its own code of morality, and their mutual love a mere device of nature to keep things going. Strip human intercourse of the proprieties, and is it reduced to this? Her judgment told her no. She knew that out of nature's device we have built a magic that will win us immortality. Far more mysterious than the call of sex to sex is the tenderness that we throw into that call. Far wider is the gulf between us and the farmyard, than between the farmyard and the garbage that nourishes it. We are evolving, in ways that science cannot measure, to ends that theology dares not contemplate. Men did produce one jewel, the gods will say, and saying will give us immortality. Margaret knew all this, but for the moment she could not feel it, and transformed the marriage of Evie and Mr. Cahill into a carnival of fools, and her own marriage, too miserable to think of that, she tore up the letter, and then wrote another. Dear Mr. Bast, I have spoken to Mr. Wilcox about you, as I promised, and am sorry to say that he has no vacancy for you. Yours truly, M. J. Schlegel. She enclosed this in a note to Helen, over which she took less trouble than she might have done, but her head was aching, and she could not stop to pick her words. Dear Helen, give him this. The Basts are no good. Henry found the woman drunk on the lawn. I am having a room got ready for you here, and will you please come round at once on getting this? The Basts are not at all the type we should trouble about. I may go round to them myself in the morning, and do anything that is fair. M. In writing this, Margaret felt that she was being practical. Something might be arranged for the Basts later on, but they must be silenced for the moment. She hoped to avoid a conversation between the woman and Helen. She rang the bell for a servant, but no one answered it. Mr. Wilcox and the Warringtons were gone to bed, and the kitchen was abandoned to Saturnalia. Consequently, she went over to the George herself. She did not enter the hotel, for discussion would have been perilous, and saying that the letter was important, she gave it to the waitress. As she recrossed the square, she saw Helen and Mr. Bath looking out of the window of the coffee-room, and feared she was already too late. Her task was not yet over. She ought to tell Henry what she had done. This came easily, for she saw him in the hall. The night wind had been rattling the pictures against the wall, and the noise had disturbed him. "'Who's there?' he called, quite the householder. Margaret walked in and passed him. "'I have asked Helen to sleep,' she said. "'She is best here, so don't lock the front door.' "'I thought someone had got in,' said Henry." At the same time I told the man that we could do nothing for him. I don't know about later, but now the Basts must clearly go. Did you say that your sister is sleeping here, after all? Probably. Is she to be shown up to your room? I have naturally nothing to say to her. I am going to bed. Will you tell the servants about Helen? Could someone go to carry her bag? He tapped a little gong, which had been bought to summon the servants. You must make more noise than that, if you want them to hear." Henry opened a door, and down the corridor came shouts of laughter. "'Far too much screaming there,' he said, and strode towards it. Margaret went upstairs. 
uncertain whether to be glad that they had met, or sorry. They had behaved as if nothing had happened, and her deepest instincts told her that this was wrong. For his own sake, some explanation was due. And yet, what could an explanation tell her? A date, a place, a few details, which she could imagine all too clearly. Now that the first shock was over, she saw that there was every reason to premise a Mrs. Bast. Henry's inner life had long laid open to her, his intellectual confusion, his obtuseness to personal influence, his strong but furtive passions. Should she refuse him because his outer life corresponded? Perhaps. Perhaps if the dishonour had been done to her, but it was done long before her day. She struggled against the feeling. She told herself that Mrs. Wilcox's wrong was her own. But she was not a bargain theorist. As she undressed, her anger, her regard for the dead, her desire for a scene, all grew weak. Henry must have it as he liked, for she loved him, and some day she would use her love to make him a better man. Pity was at the bottom of her actions all through this crisis. Pity, if one may generalize, is at the bottom of woman. When men like us, it is for our better qualities, and however tender their liking, we dare not be unworthy of it, or they will quietly let us go. But unworthiness stimulates woman. It brings out her deeper nature, for good or for evil. Here was the core of the question. Henry must be forgiven, and made better by love. Nothing else mattered. Mrs. Wilcox, that unquiet yet kindly ghost, must be left to her own wrong. To her everything was in proportion now, and she too would pity the man who was blundering up and down their lives. Had Mrs. Wilcox known of his trespass? An interesting question. But Margaret fell asleep, tethered by affection, and lulled by the murmurs of the river that descended all the night from Wales. She felt herself at one with her future home, colouring it and coloured by it, and awoke to see, for the second time, Oniton Castle conquering the morning mists. End of chapter 28 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 29 "'Henry, dear,' was her greeting. He had finished his breakfast, and was beginning the times. His sister-in-law was packing. She knelt by him, and took the paper from him, feeling that it was unusually heavy and thick. Then, putting her face where it had been, she looked up in his eyes. "'Henry, dear, look at me. No, I won't have you shirking. Look at me. There. That's all.' "'You're referring to last evening,' he said huskily. "'I have released you from your engagement. I could find excuses, but I won't. No, I won't. A thousand times, no. I'm a bad lot, and must be left at that.' Expelled from his old fortress, Mr. Wilcox was building a new one. He could no longer appear respectable to her, so he defended himself instead in a lurid past. It was not true repentance. Leave it where you will, boy. It's not going to trouble us. I know what I'm talking about, and it will make no difference. No difference? he inquired. No difference when you find that I am not the fellow you thought. He was annoyed with Miss Schlegel here. He would have preferred her to be prostrated by the blow, or even to rage. Against the tide of his sin flowed the feeling that she was not altogether womanly. Her eyes gazed too straight. They had read books that are suitable for men only. And though he had dreaded a scene, and though she had determined against one, there was a scene all the same. It was somehow imperative. "'I am unworthy of you,' he began. "'Had I been worthy, I should not have released you from your engagement. I know what I am talking about. I can't bear to talk of such things. We had better leave it.' She kissed his hand. He jerked it from her, and, rising to his feet, went on. "'You, with your sheltered life, and refined pursuits, and friends, and books, you and your sister, and women like you, I say, how can you guess the temptations that lie round a man?' "'It is difficult for us,' said Margaret. "'But if we are worth marrying, we do guess.' "'Cut off from decent society and family ties, what do you suppose happens to thousands of young fellows overseas? Isolated.' no one near. 
I know by bitter experience, and yet you say it makes no difference. Not to me. He laughed bitterly. Margaret went to the sideboard and helped herself to one of the breakfast dishes. Being the last down, she turned out the spirit lamp that kept them warm. She was tender but grave. She knew that Henry was not so much confessing his soul as pointing out the gulf between the male soul and the female, and she did not desire to hear him on this point. "'Did Helen come?' she asked. He shook his head. "'But that won't do at all, at all. We don't want her gossiping with Mrs. Bast.' "'Good God, no!' he exclaimed, suddenly natural. Then he caught himself up. "'Let them gossip. My game's up, though I thank you for your unselfishness, little as my thanks are worth.' "'Didn't she send me a message or anything?' "'I heard of none.' "'Would you ring the bell, please?' "'What to do?' "'Why, to inquire. He swaggered up to it tragically, and sounded a peal. Margaret poured herself out some coffee. The butler came and said that Miss Schlegel had slept at the George so far as he had heard. Should he go round to the George? "'I'll go, thank you,' said Margaret, and dismissed him. "'It is no good,' said Henry. "'Those things leak out. You cannot stop a story once it is started. I have known cases of other men. I despised them once. I thought that I am different. I shall never be tempted. Oh, Margaret! He came and sat down near her, improvising emotion. She could not bear to listen to him. We fellows all come to grief once in our time. Will you believe that? There are moments when the strongest man—let him who standeth take heed lest he fall. That's true, isn't it? If you knew all, you would excuse me. I was far from good influences, far even from England. I was very, very lonely, and longed for a woman's voice. That's enough. I have told you too much already for you to forgive me now." "'Yes, that's enough, dear." "'I have,' he lowered his voice. "'I have been through hell.' Gravely she considered this claim. Had he? Had he suffered tortures of remorse? Or had it been, "'There, that's over. Now for respectable life again.' The latter, if she read him rightly. A man who has been through hell does not boast of his virility. He is humble, and hides it, if, indeed, it still exists. Only in legend does the sinner come forth penitent, but terrible, to conquer pure woman by his resistless power. Henry was anxious to be terrible, but had not got it in him. He was a good average Englishman who had slipped. The really culpable point, his faithlessness to Mrs. Wilcox, never seemed to strike him. She longed to mention Mrs. Wilcox. And bit by bit the story was told her. It was a very simple story. Ten years ago was the time, a garrison town in Cyprus the place. Now and then he asked her whether she could possibly forgive him, and she answered, I have already forgiven you, Henry." She chose her words carefully, and so saved him from panic. She played the girl until he could rebuild his fortress and hide his soul from the world. When the butler came to clear away, Henry was in a very different mood, asked the fellow what he was in such a hurry for, complained of the noise last night in the servants' hall. Margaret looked intently at the butler. He, as a handsome young man, was faintly attractive to her as a woman an attraction so faint as scarcely to be perceptible, yet the skies would have fallen if she had mentioned it to Henry. On her return from the George the building operations were complete, and the old Henry fronted her, competent, cynical, and kind. He had made a clean breast, had been forgiven, and the great thing now was to forget his failure, and to send it the way of other unsuccessful investments. Jackie rejoined Howard's End and Ducey Street, and the Vermilion motor-car, and the Argentine hard dollars, and all the things and people for whom he had never had much use, and had less now. Their memory hampered him. He could scarcely attend to Margaret, who brought back disquieting news from the George. Helen and her clients had gone. "'Well, let them go. The man and his wife, I mean, for the more we see of your sister, the better. But they have gone separately. Helen very early, the Basts just before I arrived. They have left no message. 
They have answered neither of my notes. I don't like to think what it all means. What did you say in the notes? I told you last night. Oh, er, uh, yes. Dear, would you like one turn in the garden? Margaret took his arm. The beautiful weather soothed her. But the wheels of Evie's wedding were still at work, tossing the guests outwards as deftly as they had drawn them in, and she could not be with him long. It had been arranged that they should motor to Shrewsbury, whence he would go north and she back to London with the Warringtons. For a fraction of time she was happy. Then her brain recommenced. I am afraid there has been gossiping of some kind at the George. Helen would not have left unless she had heard something. I mismanaged that. It is wretched. I ought to have parted her from that woman at once. Margaret! he exclaimed, loosing her arm impressively. Yes, yes, Henry. I am far from a saint, in fact the reverse. But you have taken me, for better or worse. Bygones must be bygones. You have promised to forgive me. Margaret, a promise is a promise. Never mention that woman again. Except for some practical reason. Never. Practical? You practical? Yes, I'm practical, she murmured, stooping over the mowing machine and playing with the grass which trickled through her fingers like sand. He had silenced her, but her fears made him uneasy. Not for the first time he was threatened with blackmail. He was rich and supposed to be moral. The Basts knew that he was not, and might find it profitable to hint as much. At all events, you mustn't worry, he said. This is a man's business. He thought intently. On no account mention it to anybody. Margaret flushed at advice so elementary, but he was really paving the way for a lie. If necessary, he would deny that he had ever known Mrs. Bast, and prosecute her for libel. Perhaps he never had known her. Here was Margaret, who behaved as if he had not. There the house. Round them were half a dozen gardeners, clearing up after his daughter's wedding. All was so solid and spruce, that the past flew up out of sight like a spring blind, leaving only the last five minutes unrolled. Glancing at these, he saw that the car would be round during the next five, and plunged into action. Gongs were tapped, orders issued, Margaret was sent to dress, and the housemaid to sweep up the long trickle of grass that she had left across the hall. As is man to the universe, so was the mind of Mr. Wilcox to the minds of some men, a concentrated light upon a tiny spot, a little ten minutes moving self-contained through its appointed years. No pagan he— who lives for the now, and may be wiser than all philosophers. He lived for the five minutes that have passed, and the five to come. He had the business mind. How did he stand now as his motor slipped out of Oniton and breasted the great round hills? Margaret had heard a certain rumour, but was all right. She had forgiven him, God bless her, and he felt the manlier for it. Charles and Evie had not heard it, and never must hear. No more must Paul. Over his children he felt great tenderness, which he did not try to track to a cause. Mrs. Wilcox was too far back in his life. He did not connect her with the sudden aching love that he felt for Evie. Poor little Evie! He trusted that Cahill would make her a decent husband. And Margaret? How did she stand? She had several minor worries. Clearly her sister had heard something. She dreaded meeting her in town, and she was anxious about Leonard— for whom they certainly were responsible. Nor ought Mrs. Bass to starve. But the main situation had not altered. She still loved Henry. His actions, not his disposition, had disappointed her, and she could bear that. And she loved her future home. Standing up in the car, just where she had leapt from it two days before, she gazed back with deep emotion upon Oniton. Besides the Grange and the Castle Keep, she could now pick out the church and the black and white gables of the George. There was the bridge, and the river nibbling its green peninsula. She could even see the bathing-shed. But while she was looking for Charles's new springboard, the forehead of the hill rose up and hid the whole scene. She never saw it again. Day and night the river flows down into England. Day after day the sun retreats into the Welsh mountains, and the tower chimes— 
see the conquering hero. But the Wilcoxes have no part in the place, nor in any place. It is not their names that recur in the parish register. It is not their ghosts that sigh among the alders at evening. They have swept into the valley and swept out of it, leaving a little dust and a little money behind. End of chapter 29 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 30 Tibby was now approaching his last year at Oxford. He had moved out of college, and was contemplating the universe, or such portions of it as concerned him, from his comfortable lodgings in Long Wall. He was not concerned with much. When a young man is untroubled by passions and sincerely indifferent to public opinion, his outlook is necessarily limited. Tibby neither wished to strengthen the position of the rich, nor to improve that of the poor, and so was well content to watch the elms nodding behind the mildly embattled parapets of Maudlin. There are worse lives. Though selfish, he was never cruel. Though affected in manner, he never posed. Like Margaret, he disdained the heroic equipment, and it was only after many visits that men discovered Schlegel to possess a character and a brain. He had done well in Mauds, much to the surprise of those who attended lectures and took proper exercise, and was now glancing disdainfully at Chinese, in case he should some day consent to qualify as a student interpreter. To him thus employed, Helen entered. A telegram had preceded her. He noticed, in a distant way, that his sister had altered. As a rule he found her too pronounced, and had never come across this look of appeal, pathetic yet dignified, the look of a sailor who has lost everything at sea. "'I have come from Oniton,' she began. "'There has been a great deal of trouble there.' "'Who's for lunch?' said Tibby, picking up the claret which was warming in the hearth. Helen sat down submissively at the table. "'Why such an early start?' he asked. "'Sunrise or something, when I could get away.' "'So I surmise. Why?' "'I don't know what's to be done, Tibby. I am very much upset at a piece of news that concerns Meg, and do not want to face her, and I am not going back to Wickham Place. I stopped here to tell you this.' The landlady came in with the cutlets. Tibby put a marker in the leaves of his Chinese grammar and helped them. Oxford, the Oxford of the vacation, dreamed and rustled outside, and indoors the little fire was coated with grey where the sunshine touched it. Helen continued her odd story. "'Give Meg my love, and say that I want to be alone. I mean to go to Munich, or else Bonn.' "'Such a message is easily given,' said her brother. "'As regards Wickham Place, and my share of the furniture, you and she are to do exactly as you like. My own feeling is that everything may just as well be sold. What does one want with dusty economic books which have made the world no better, or with mother's hideous chiffoniers. I have also another commission for you. I want you to deliver a letter." She got up. "'I haven't written it yet. Why shouldn't I post it, though?' She sat down again. "'My head is rather wretched. I hope that none of your friends are likely to come in.' Tibby locked the door. His friends often found it in this condition. Then he asked whether anything had gone wrong at Evie's wedding. "'Not there,' said Helen, and burst into tears. He had known her hysterical. It was one of her aspects with which he had no concern. And yet these tears touched him as something unusual. They were nearer the things that did concern him, such as music. He laid down his knife and looked at her curiously. Then, as she continued to sob, he went on with his lunch. The time came for the second course, and she was still crying. Apple Charlotte was to follow, which spoils by waiting. "'Do you mind Mrs. Martlett coming in?' he asked. "'Or shall I take it from her at the door?' "'Could I bathe my eyes, Tippy?' He took her to his bedroom, and introduced the pudding in her absence. Having helped himself, he put it down to warm in the hearth. His hand stretched towards the grammar, and soon he was turning over the pages, raising his eyebrows scornfully, perhaps at human nature, perhaps at Chinese. To him thus employed, Helen returned. 
She had pulled herself together, but the grave appeal had not vanished from her eyes. "'Now for the explanation,' she said. "'Why didn't I begin with it? I have found out something about Mr. Wilcox. He has behaved very wrongly indeed, and ruined two people's lives. It all came on me very suddenly last night. I am very much upset, and I do not know what to do. Mrs. Bast! Oh, those people!' Helen seemed silenced. "'Shall I lock the door again?' "'No, thanks, to begins. You're being very good to me. I want to tell you the story before I go abroad. You must do exactly what you like. Treat it as part of the furniture. Meg cannot have heard it yet, I think. But I cannot face her and tell her that the man she is going to marry has misconducted himself. I don't even know whether she ought to be told. Knowing as she does that I dislike him, she will suspect me, and think that I want to ruin her match. I simply don't know what to make of such a thing. I trust your judgment. What would you do?" "'I gather he has had a mistress,' said Tibby. Helen flushed with shame and anger. "'And ruined two people's lives, and goes about saying that personal actions count for nothing, and they will always be rich and poor. He met her when he was trying to get rich out in Cyprus. I don't wish to make him worse than he is, and no doubt she was ready enough to meet him. But there it is. They met. He goes his way, and she goes hers. What do you suppose is the end of such women?" He conceded that it was a bad business. They end in two ways. Either they sink till the lunatic asylums and the workhouses are full of them, and cause Mr. Wilcox to write letters to the papers complaining of our national degeneracy, or else they entrap a boy into marriage before it is too late. She—I can't blame her. But this isn't all," she continued after a long pause, during which the landlady served them with coffee. I come now to the business that took us to Oniton. We went all three. Acting on Mr. Wilcox's advice, the man throws up a secure situation, and takes an insecure one, from which he is dismissed. There are certain excuses, but in the main Mr. Wilcox is to blame, as Meg herself admitted. It is only common justice that he should employ the man himself. But he meets the woman, and like the cur that he is, he refuses and tries to get rid of them. He makes Meg right. Two notes came from her late that evening. One for me, one for Leonard, dismissing him with barely a reason. I couldn't understand. Then it comes out that Mrs. Bast had spoken to Mr. Wilcox on the lawn, while we left her to get rooms, and was still speaking about him when Leonard came back to her. This Leonard knew all along. He thought it natural he should be ruined twice. Natural! Could you have contained yourself?" "'It is certainly a very bad business,' said Tibby. His reply seemed to calm his sister. I was afraid that I saw it out of proportion. But you are right outside it, and you must know. In a day or two, or perhaps a week, take whatever steps you think fit. I leave it in your hands." She concluded her charge. "'The facts, as they touch Meg, are all before you,' she added. And Tibby sighed, and felt it rather hard that, because of his open mind, he should be impanelled to serve as a juror. He had never been interested in human beings, for which one must blame him, but he had had rather too much of them at Wickham Place. Just as some people cease to attend when books are mentioned, so Tibby's attention wandered when personal relations came under discussion. Ought Margaret to know what Helen knew the Basts to know? Similar questions had vexed him from infancy, and at Oxford he had learned to say that the importance of human beings has been vastly overrated by specialists. The epigram, with its faint whiff of the eighties, meant nothing. But he might have let it off now if his sister had not been ceaselessly beautiful. "'You see, Helen—have a cigarette—I don't see what I'm to do.' "'Then there's nothing to be done. I dare say you are right. Let them marry. There remains the question of compensation. Do you want me to adjudicate that, too? Had you not better consult an expert?' This part is in confidence," said Helen. It has nothing to do with Meg, and do not mention it to her. The compensation. 
I do not see who is to pay it if I don't, and I have already decided on the minimum sum. As soon as possible I am placing it to your account, and when I am in Germany you will pay it over for me. I shall never forget your kindness to Pickens if you do this. What is the sum? Five thousand. Good God alive! said Tibby, and went crimson. Now what is the good of driblets? To go through life having done one thing, to have raised one person from the abyss, not these puny gifts of shillings and blankets, making the grey more grey. No doubt people will think me extraordinary. I don't care a damn what people think, cried he, heeded to unusual manliness of diction. But it's half what you have. Not nearly half. She spread out her hands over her soiled skirt. I have far too much, and we settled at Chelsea last spring that three hundred a year is necessary to set a man on his feet. What I give will bring in a hundred and fifty between two. It isn't enough. He could not recover. He was not angry or even shocked, and he saw that Helen would still have plenty to live on. But it amazed him to think what haycocks people can make of their lives. His delicate intonations would not work, and he could only blurt out that five thousand pounds would mean a great deal of bother for him personally. "'I didn't expect you to understand me.' "'I? I understand nobody.' "'But he'll do it.' "'Apparently.' "'I leave you two commissions, then. The first concerns Mr. Wilcox, and you are to use your discretion. The second concerns the money, and is to be mentioned to no one, and carried out literally.' You will send a hundred pounds on account to-morrow." He walked with her to the station, passing through those streets whose serried beauty never bewildered him and never fatigued. The lovely creature raised domes and spires into the cloudless blue, and only the ganglion of vulgarity round Carfax showed how evanescent was the phantom, how faint its claim to represent England. Helen, rehearsing her commission, noticed nothing. The basts were in her brain, and she retold the crisis in a meditative way, which might have made other men curious. She was seeing whether it would hold. He asked her once why she had taken the basts right into the heart of Evie's wedding. She stopped like a frightened animal, and said, "'Does that seem to you so odd?' Her eyes, the hand laid on the mouth, quite haunted him, until they were absorbed into the figure of St. Mary the Virgin, before whom he paused for a moment on the walk home." It is convenient to follow him in the discharge of his duties. Margaret summoned him the next day. She was terrified at Helen's flight, and he had to say that she had called in at Oxford. Then she said, Did she seem worried at any rumour about Henry? He answered, Yes. I knew it was that, she exclaimed. I'll write to her. Tibby was relieved. He then sent the cheque to the address that Helen gave him, and stated that later on he was instructed to forward five thousand pounds. An answer came back, very civil and quiet in tone, such an answer as Tibby himself would have given. The cheque was returned, the legacy refused, the writer being in no need of money. Tibby forwarded this to Helen, adding in the fullness of his heart that Leonard Bast seemed somewhat a monumental person after all. Helen's reply was frantic. He was to take no notice— he was to go down at once and say that she commanded acceptance. He went. A scurf of books and china ornaments awaited them. The Basts had just been evicted for not paying their rent, and had wandered no one knew whither. Helen had begun bungling with her money by this time, and had even sold out her shares in the Nottingham and Derby Railway. For some weeks she did nothing. Then she reinvested, and, owing to the good advice of her stockbrokers, became rather richer than she had been before. End of chapter 30 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 31 Houses have their own ways of dying, falling as variously as the generations of men, some with a tragic roar, some quietly, but to an afterlife in the city of ghosts, while from others, and thus was the death of Wickham Place, the spirit slips before the body perishes. It had decayed in the spring, disintegrating the girls more than they knew, and causing either to accost unfamiliar regions. By September it was a corpse, void of emotion, 
and scarcely hallowed by the memories of thirty years of happiness. Through its round-topped doorway passed furniture, and pictures, and books, until the last room was gutted and the last van had rumbled away. It stood for a week or two longer, open-eyed, as if astonished at its own emptiness. Then it fell. Navvies came, and spilt it back into the grey. With their muscles and their beery good temper, they were not the worst of undertakers for a house which had always been human, and had not mistaken culture for an end. The furniture, with a few exceptions, went down into Hertfordshire, Mr. Wilcox having most kindly offered Howard's End as a warehouse. Mr. Bryce had died abroad, an unsatisfactory affair, and as there seemed little guarantee that the rent would be paid regularly, he cancelled the agreement, and resumed possession himself. Until he relet the house, the Schlegels were welcome to stack their furniture in the garage and lower rooms. Margaret demurred, but Tibby accepted the offer gladly. It saved him from coming to any decision about the future. The plate and the more valuable pictures found a safer home in London, but the bulk of the things went countryways, and were entrusted to the guardianship of Miss Avery. Shortly before the move, our hero and heroine were married. They have weathered the storm, and may reasonably expect peace. To have no illusions, and yet to love, what stronger surety can a woman find? She had seen her husband's past as well as his heart. She knew her own heart with a thoroughness that commonplace people believe impossible. The heart of Mrs. Wilcox was alone hidden, and perhaps it is superstitious to speculate on the feelings of the dead. They were married quietly, really quietly, for as the day approached she refused to go through another Oniton. Her brother gave her away, her aunt, who was out of health, presided over a few colourless refreshments. The Wilcoxes were represented by Charles, who witnessed the marriage settlement, and by Mr. Cahill. Paul did send a cablegram. In a few minutes, and without the aid of music, the clergyman made the man and wife, and soon the glass shade had fallen that cuts off married couples from the world. She, a monogamist, regretted the cessation of some of life's innocent odours. He, whose instincts were polygamous, felt morally braced by the change, and less liable to the temptations that had assailed him in the past. They spent their honeymoon near Innsbruck. Henry knew of a reliable hotel there, and Margaret hoped for a meeting with her sister. In this she was disappointed. As they came south, Helen retreated over the Brenner, and wrote an unsatisfactory postcard from the shores of the Lake of Garda, saying that her plans were uncertain, and had better be ignored. Evidently she disliked meeting Henry. Two months are surely enough to accustom an outsider to a situation which a wife has accepted in two days, and Margaret had again to regret her sister's lack of self-control. In a long letter she pointed out the need of charity in sexual matters, so little is known about them. It is hard enough for those who are personally touched to judge. Then how futile must be the verdict of society! I don't say there is no standard, for that would destroy morality, only that there can be no standard until our impulses are classified and better understood. Helen thanked her for her kind letter, rather a curious reply. She moved south again and spoke of wintering in Naples. Mr. Wilcox was not sorry that the meeting failed. Helen left him time to grow skin over his wound. There were still moments when it pained him. Had he only known that Margaret was awaiting him, Margaret, so lively and intelligent, and yet so submissive, he would have kept himself worthier of her. Incapable of grouping the past, he confused the episode of Jackie with another episode that had taken place in the days of his bachelorhood. The two made one crop of wild oats, for which he was heartily sorry, and he could not see that those oats are of a darker stock which are rooted in another's dishonour. Unchastity and infidelity were as confused to him as to the Middle Ages, his only moral teacher. Ruth, poor old Ruth, did not enter into his calculations at all, for poor old Ruth had never found him out. His affection for his present wife grew steadily. Her cleverness gave him no trouble, and indeed he liked to see her reading poetry or something about social questions. It distinguished her from the wives of other men. He had only to call, and she clapped the book up and was ready to do what he wished. Then they would argue so jollily, and once or twice she had him in quite a tight corner, 
but as soon as he grew really serious, she gave in. Man is for war, woman for the recreation of the warrior, but he does not dislike it if she makes a show of fight. She cannot win in a real battle, having no muscles, only nerves. Nerves make her jump out of a moving motor-car, or refuse to be married fashionably. The warrior may well allow her to triumph on such occasions. They move not the imperishable plinth of things that touch his peace. Margaret had a bad attack of these nerves during the honeymoon. He told her, casually as was his habit, that Oniton Grange was let. She showed her annoyance, and asked rather crossly why she had not been consulted. "'I didn't want to bother you,' he replied. "'Besides, I have only heard for certain this morning.' "'Where are we to live?' said Margaret, trying to laugh. "'I loved the place extraordinarily. Don't you believe in having a permanent home, Henry?' He assured her that she misunderstood him. It is home life that distinguishes us from the foreigner. But he did not believe in a damp home. "'This is news. I never heard till this minute that Oniton was damp.' "'My dear girl,' he flung out his hand, "'have you eyes? Have you a skin? How could it be anything but damp in such a situation? In the first place the Grange is on clay, and built where the castle moat must have been. Then there's that detestable little river, steaming all night like a kettle. Feel the cellar walls. Look up under the eaves. Ask Sir James, or any one. Those Shropshire valleys are notorious. The only possible place for a house in Shropshire is on a hill. But for my part I think the country is too far from London, and the scenery nothing special." Margaret could not resist saying, "'Why did you go there, then?' "'I—because—' He drew his head back, and grew rather angry. "'Why have we come to the Tyrol, if it comes to that? One might go on asking such questions indefinitely.' One might, but he was only gaining time for a plausible answer. Out it came, and he believed it as soon as it was spoken. "'The truth is, I took Oniton on account of Evie. Don't let this go any further.' "'Certainly not.' "'I shouldn't like her to know that she nearly let me in for a very bad bargain.' No sooner did I sign the agreement than she got engaged. Poor little girl! She was so keen on it all, and wouldn't even wait to make proper inquiries about the shooting. Afraid it would get snapped up, just like all of your sex. Well, no harm's done. She has had her country wedding, and I've got rid of my house to some fellows who are starting a preparatory school. Where shall we live, then, Henry? I should enjoy living somewhere. I have not yet decided. What about Norfolk?" Margaret was silent. Marriage had not saved her from the sense of flux. London was but a foretaste of this nomadic civilization which is altering human nature so profoundly, and throws upon personal relations a stress greater than they have ever borne before. Under cosmopolitanism, if it comes, we shall receive no help from the earth. Trees and meadows and mountains will only be a spectacle and the binding force that they once exercised on character must be entrusted to love alone. May love be equal to the task. "'It is now what?' continued Henry. "'Nearly October. Let us camp for the winter at Ducie Street, and look out for something in the spring.' "'If possible, something permanent. I can't be as young as I was, for these alterations don't suit me.' "'But, my dear, which would you rather have?' alterations or rheumatism." "'I see your point,' said Margaret, getting up. "'If Oniton is really damp, it is impossible, and must be inhabited by little boys. Only in the spring let us look before we leap. I will take warning by Evie, and not hurry you. Remember that you have a free hand this time. These endless moves must be bad for the furniture, and are certainly expensive. What a practical little woman it is! What's it been reading? Theo—Theo— Theo, how much? Theosophy. So Ducey Street was her first fate. A pleasant enough fate. The house, being only a little larger than Wickham Place, trained her for the immense establishment that was promised in the spring. They were frequently away, but at home life ran fairly regularly. In the morning Henry went to the business, and his sandwich, a relic this of some prehistoric craving, was always cut by her own hand. He did not rely upon the sandwich for lunch, but liked to have it by him in case he grew hungry at eleven. 
When he had gone, there was the house to look after, and the servants to humanize, and several kettles of Helen's to keep on the boil. Her conscience pricked her a little about the basts. She was not sorry to have lost sight of them. No doubt Leonard was worth helping, but being Henry's wife, she preferred to help someone else. As for theatres, and discussion societies, they attracted her less and less. She began to miss new movements, and to spend her spare time re-reading or thinking, rather to the concern of her Chelsea friends. They attributed the change to her marriage, and perhaps some deep instinct did warn her not to travel further from her husband than was inevitable. Yet the main cause lay deeper still. She had outgrown stimulants, and was passing from words to things. It was doubtless a pity not to keep up with Vedekind or John, but some closing of the gates is inevitable after thirty, if the mind itself is to become a creative power. End of chapter 31 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 32 She was looking at plans one day in the following spring. They had finally decided to go down into Sussex and build, when Mrs. Charles Wilcox was announced. "'Have you heard the news?' Dolly cried, as soon as she entered the room. "'Charles is so ang—' "'I mean, he is sure you know about it, or rather, that you don't know.' "'Why, Dolly,' said Margaret, placidly kissing her, "'here's a surprise. How are the boys and the baby?' Boys and the baby were well, and in describing a great row that there had been at Hilton Tennis Club, Dolly forgot her news. The wrong people had tried to get in. The rector, as representing the older inhabitants, had said, Charles had said, the tax collector had said, Charles had regretted not saying, and she closed the description with, "'But lucky you with four courts of your own at Midhurst!' "'It will be very jolly,' replied Margaret. "'Are those the plans? Does it matter be seeing them?' "'Of course not.' "'Charles has never seen the plans.' "'They have only just arrived. Here is the ground floor. No, that's rather difficult. Try the elevation. We are to have a good many gables and a picturesque skyline.' "'What makes it smell so funny?' said Dolly, after a moment's inspection. She was incapable of understanding plans or maps. "'I suppose the paper. And which way up is it?' "'Just the ordinary way up. That's the skyline, and the part that smells strongest is the sky. "'Well, ask me another. "'Margaret, oh, what was I going to say? "'How's Helen?' "'Quite well. "'Is she never coming back to England? "'Every one thinks it's awfully odd she doesn't.' "'So it is,' said Margaret, trying to conceal her vexation. "'She was getting rather sore on this point. "'Helen is odd, awfully.' She has now been away eight months. But hasn't she any address? A post restant somewhere in Bavaria is her address. Do write her a line. I will look it up for you. No, don't bother. That's eight months she has been away, surely. Exactly. She left just after Evie's wedding. It would be eight months. Just when baby was born, then? Just so. Dolly sighed and stared enviously round the drawing-room. She was beginning to lose her brightness and good looks. The Charleses were not well off, for Mr. Wilcox, having brought up his children with expensive tastes, believed in letting them shift for themselves. After all, he had not treated them generously. Yet another baby was expected, she told Margaret, and they would have to give up the motor. Margaret sympathized, but in a formal fashion, and Dolly little imagined that the stepmother was urging Mr. Wilcox to make them a more liberal allowance. She sighed again, and at last the particular grievance was remembered. "'Oh, yes!' she cried. "'That is it! Miss Avery has been unpacking your packing-cases.' "'Why has she done that? How unnecessary!' "'Ask another. I suppose you ordered her to.' "'I gave no such orders. Perhaps she was airing the things. She did undertake to light an occasional fire.' "'It was far more than an air!' said Dolly, solemnly. The floor sounds covered with books. Charles sent me to know what is to be done, for he feels certain you don't know." "'Books!' cried Margaret, moved by the holy word. "'Dolly, are you serious? Has she been touching our books?' "'Hasn't she, though? 
What used to be the halls full of them? Charles thought for certain you knew of it. I am very much obliged to you, Dolly. What can have come over Miss Avery? I must go down about it at once. Some of the books are my brother's and quite valuable. She had no right to open any of the cases. I say she's dotty. She was the one that never got married, you know. Oh, I say, perhaps she thinks your books are wedding presents to herself. Old maids are taken that way sometimes. Miss Avery hates us all like poison ever since her frightful dust-up with Evie. I hadn't heard of that, said Margaret. A visit from Dolly had its compensations. Didn't you know she gave Evie a present last August, and Evie returned it, and then— Oh, galoshes! You never read such a letter as Miss Avery wrote. But it was wrong of Evie to return it. It wasn't like her to do such a heartless thing. But the present was so expensive. Why does that make any difference, Dolly? Still, when it costs over five pounds. I didn't see it, but it was a lovely enamel pendant from a Bond Street shop. You can't very well accept that kind of thing from a farm-woman. Now can you? You accepted a present from Miss Avery when you were married. Oh, mine was old earthenware stuff, not worth a halfpenny. Evie's was quite different. You'd have to ask any one to the wedding who gave you a pendant like that. Uncle Percy and Albert and Father and Charles all said it was quite impossible, and when four men agree, what is a girl to do? Evie didn't want to upset the old thing, so thought a sort of joking letter best, and returned the pendant straight to the shop to save Miss Avery trouble. But Miss Avery said— Dolly's eyes grew round. It was a perfectly awful letter. Charles said it was the letter of a madman. In the end she had the pendant back again from the shop, and threw it into the duck-pond. Did she give any reasons? We think she meant to be invited to Oniton, and so climb into society. She's rather old for that, said Margaret pensively. May she not have given the present to Evie in remembrance of her mother? That's a notion. Give every one their due, eh? Well, I suppose I ought to be toddling. Come along, Mr. Muff. You want a new coat, but I don't know who'll give it to you, I'm sure. And addressing her apparel with mournful humour, Dolly moved from the room. Margaret followed her to ask whether Henry knew about Miss Avery's rudeness. Oh, yes. I wonder, then, why he let me ask her to look after the house. But she's only a farm woman, said Dolly, and her explanation proved correct. Henry only censured the lower classes when it suited him. He bore with Miss Avery as with Crane, because he could get good value out of them. I have patience with a man who knows his job, he would say, really having patience with the job, and not the man. Paradoxical as it may sound, he had something of the artist about him. He would pass over an insult to his daughter, sooner than lose a good charwoman for his wife. Margaret judged it better to settle the little trouble herself. Parties were evidently ruffled. With Henry's permission, she wrote a pleasant note to Miss Avery, asking her to leave the cases untouched. Then, at the first convenient opportunity, she went down herself, intending to repack her belongings and store them properly in the local warehouse. The plan had been amateurish and a failure. Tibby promised to accompany her, but at the last moment begged to be excused. So, for the second time in her life, she entered the house alone. End of chapter 32 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 33 The day of her visit was exquisite, and the last of unclouded happiness that she was to have for many months. Her anxiety about Helen's extraordinary absence was still dormant, and as for a possible brush with Miss Avery, that only gave zest to the expedition. She had also eluded Dolly's invitation to luncheon. Walking straight up from the station, she crossed the village green and entered the long chestnut avenue that connects it with the church. The church itself stood in the village once, but it there attracted so many worshippers that the devil, in a pet, snatched it from its foundations, and poised it on an inconvenient knoll three-quarters of a mile away. If this story is true, the chestnut avenue must have been planted by the angels. No more tempting approach could be imagined for the lukewarm Christian, and if he still finds the walk too long, the devil is defeated all the same, science having built Holy Trinity, a chapel of ease, near the Charleses, and roofed it with tin. 
Up the avenue Margaret strolled slowly, stopping to watch the sky that gleamed through the upper branches of the chestnuts, or to finger the little horseshoes on the lower branches. Why has not England a great mythology? Our folklore has never advanced beyond daintiness, and the greater melodies about our countryside have all issued through the pipes of Greece. Deep and true as the native imagination can be, it seems to have failed here. It has stopped with the witches and the fairies. It cannot vivify one fraction of a summer field, or give names to half a dozen stars. England still waits for the supreme moment of her literature, for the great poet who shall voice her, or better still, for the thousand little poets whose voices shall pass into our common talk. At the church the scenery changed. The chestnut avenue opened into a road, smooth but narrow, which led into the untouched country. She followed it for over a mile. Its little hesitations pleased her. Having no urgent destiny, it strolled downhill or up as it wished, taking no trouble about the gradients, or about the view, which nevertheless expanded. The great estates that throttle the south of Hertfordshire were less obtrusive here, and the appearance of the land was neither aristocratic nor suburban. To define it was difficult, but Margaret knew what it was not. It was not snobbish. Though its contours were slight, there was a touch of freedom in their sweep to which Surrey will never attain, and the distant brow of the Chilterns towered like a mountain. Left to itself, was Margaret's opinion, this county would vote liberal. The comradeship, not passionate, that is our highest gift as a nation, was promised by it, as by the low brick farm where she called for the key. But the inside of the farm was disappointing. A most finished young person received her. "'Yes, Mrs. Wilcox. No, Mrs. Wilcox. Oh, yes, Mrs. Wilcox. Auntie received your letter quite duly. Auntie has gone up to your little place at the present moment. Shall I send the servant to direct you?' Followed by— of course, Auntie does not generally look after your place. She only does it to oblige a neighbour as something exceptional. It gives her something to do. She spends quite a lot of her time there. My husband says to me sometimes, Where's Auntie? I say, Need you ask? She's at Howard's End. Yes, Mrs. Wilcox. Mrs. Wilcox, could I prevail upon you to accept a piece of cake? Not if I cut it for you. Margaret refused the cake but unfortunately this acquired her gentility in the eyes of Miss Avery's niece. "'I cannot let you go on alone. Now don't. You really mustn't. I will direct you myself if it comes to that. I must get my hat. Now,' roguishly, "'Mrs. Wilcox, don't you move while I am gone.' Stunned, Margaret did not move from the best parlour, over which the touch of Art Nouveau had fallen. But the other rooms looked in keeping— though they conveyed the peculiar sadness of a rural interior. Here had lived an elder race, to which we look back with disquietude. The country which we visit at weekends was really a home to it, and the graver sides of life, the deaths, the partings, the yearnings for love, have the deepest expression in the heart of the fields. All was not sadness. The sun was shining without. The thrush sang his two syllables on the budding gulder rose. Some children were playing uproariously in heaps of golden straw. It was the presence of sadness at all that surprised Margaret, and ended by giving her a feeling of completeness. In these English farms, if anywhere, one might see life steadily, and see it whole, group in one vision its transitoriness, and its eternal youth, connect, connect without bitterness, until all men are brothers. But her thoughts were interrupted by the return of Miss Avery's niece, and were so tranquilizing that she suffered the interruption gladly. It was quicker to go out by the back door, and after due explanations they went out by it. The niece was now mortified by unnumerable chickens, who rushed up to her feet for food, and by a shameless and maternal sow. She did not know what animals were coming to. But her gentility withered at the touch of the sweet air. The wind was rising scattering the straw and ruffling the tails of the ducks as they floated in families over Evie's pendant. One of those delicious gales of spring, in which leaves stiffened buds seemed to rustle, swept over the land and then fell silent. Georgia sang the thrush. Cuckoo came furtively from the cliff of pine trees. Georgia, pretty Georgia, and the other birds joined in with nonsense. The hedge was a half-painted picture, which would be finished in a few days. 
Celandines grew on its banks, lords and ladies and primroses in the defended hollows. The wild rose-bushes, still bearing their withered hips, showed also the promise of blossom. Spring had come, clad in no classical garb, yet fairer than all springs. Fairer even than she who walks through the myrtles of Tuscany, with the graces before her, and the zephyr behind. The two women walked up the lane full of outward civility. But Margaret was thinking how difficult it was to be earnest about furniture on such a day, and the niece was thinking about hats. Thus engaged, they reached Howard's end. Petulant cries of, "'Auntie!' severed the air. There was no reply, and the front door was locked. "'Are you sure that Miss Avery is up here?' asked Margaret. "'Oh, yes, Mrs. Wilcox, quite sure. She is here daily.' Margaret tried to look in through the dining-room window, but the curtain inside was drawn tightly. So with the drawing-room and the hall. The appearance of these curtains was familiar, yet she did not remember them being there on her other visit. Her impression was that Mr. Bryce had taken everything away. They tried the back. Here again they received no answer, and could see nothing. The kitchen window was fitted with the blind, while the pantry and scullery had pieces of wood propped up against them, which looked ominously like the lids of packing-cases. Margaret thought of her books, and she lifted up her voice also. At the first cry she succeeded. "'Well, well,' replied someone inside the house. "'If it isn't Mrs. Wilcox, come at last.' "'Have you got the key, Auntie?' "'Madge, go away,' said Miss Avery, still invisible. "'Auntie, it's Mrs. Wilcox.' Margaret supported her. "'Your niece and I have come together.' "'Madge, go away. This is no moment for your hat.' The poor woman went red. "'Auntie gets more eccentric lately,' she said nervously. "'Miss Avery,' called Margaret, "'I have come about the furniture. Could you kindly let me in?' "'Yes, Mrs. Wilcox,' said the voice. "'Of course.' But after that came silence. They called again without response. They walked round the house disconsolately. "'I hope Miss Avery is not ill,' hazarded Margaret. "'Well, if you'll excuse me,' said Madge, "'perhaps I ought to be leaving you now. The servants need seeing to at the farm. Auntie is so odd at times.' Gathering up her elegancies, she retired defeated, and, as if her departure had loosed a spring, the front door opened at once. Miss Avery said, "'Well, come right in, Mrs. Wilcox,' quite pleasantly and calmly. "'Thank you so much,' began Margaret, but broke off at the sight of an umbrella-stand. It was her own. "'Come right into the hall first, said Miss Avery. She drew the curtain, and Margaret uttered a cry of despair. For an appalling thing had happened. The hall was fitted up with the contents of the library from Wickham Place. The carpet had been laid, the big work-table drawn up near the window, the bookcases filled the wall opposite the fireplace, and her father's sword—this is what bewildered her particularly— had been drawn from its scabbard, and hung naked amongst the sober volumes. Miss Avery must have worked for days. "'I'm afraid this isn't what we meant,' she began. "'Mr. Wilcox and I never intended the cases to be touched. For instance, these books are my brother's. We are storing them for him, and for my sister, who is abroad. When you kindly undertook to look after things, we never expected you to do so much.' "'The house has been empty long enough,' said the old woman. Margaret refused to argue. "'I dare say we didn't explain,' she said civilly. "'It has been a mistake, and very likely our mistake.' "'Mrs. Wilcox, it has been mistake upon mistake for fifty years. The house is Mrs. Wilcox's, and she would not desire it to stand empty any longer.' To help the poor decaying brain, Margaret said, "'Yes, Mrs. Wilcox's house, the mother of Mr. Charles.' "'Mistake upon mistake,' said Miss Avery. Mistake upon mistake. Well, I don't know," said Margaret, sitting down in one of her own chairs. I really don't know what's to be done. She could not help laughing. The other said, "Yes, it should be a merry house enough." I don't know. I dare say. Well, thank you very much, Miss Avery. Yes, that's all right. Delightful. There is still the parlour. She went through the door opposite and drew a curtain. Light flooded the drawing-room and the drawing-room furniture from Wickham Place. And the dining-room! More curtains were drawn, more windows were flung open to the spring. Then through here, Miss Avery continued passing and repassing through the hall. 
Her voice was lost, but Margaret heard her pulling up the kitchen blind. "'I've not finished here yet,' she announced, returning. "'There's still a deal to do. The farm lads will carry your great wardrobes upstairs, for there's no need to go into expense at Hilton.' "'It is all a mistake,' repeated Margaret, feeling that she must put her foot down. "'A misunderstanding. Mr. Wilcox and I are not going to live at Howard's End.' "'Oh, indeed. On account of his hay fever?' We have settled to build a new home for ourselves in Sussex, and part of this furniture, my part, will go down there presently." She looked at Miss Avery intently, trying to understand the kink in her brain. Here was no maundering old woman. Her wrinkles were shrewd and humorous. She looked capable of scathing wit, and also of high but unostentatious nobility. "'You think that you won't come back to live here, Mrs. Wilcox, but you will.' "'That remains to be seen.' said Margaret, smiling. We have no intention of doing so for the present. We happen to need a much larger house. Circumstances oblige us to give big parties. Of course, some day. One never knows, does one?" Miss Avery retorted. "'Some day! Don't talk about some day. You are living here now.' "'Am I?' "'You are living here, and have been for the last ten minutes, if you ask me.' It was a senseless remark. But with a queer feeling of disloyalty, Margaret rose from her chair. She felt that Henry had been obscurely censured. They went into the dining-room, where the sunlight poured in upon her mother's chiffonier, and upstairs, where many an old god peeped from a new niche. The furniture fitted extraordinarily well. In the central room, over the hall, the room that Helen had slept in four years ago, Miss Avery had placed Tibby's old bassinet. "'The nursery,' she said. Margaret turned away without speaking. At last everything was seen. The kitchen and lobby were still stacked with furniture and straw, but as far as she could make out, nothing had been broken or scratched. A pathetic display of ingenuity. Then they took a friendly stroll in the garden. It had gone wild since her last visit. The gravel sweep was weedy, and grass had sprung up at the very jaws of the garage, and Evie's rockery was only bumps. Perhaps Evie was responsible for Miss Avery's oddness, but Margaret suspected that the cause lay deeper, and that the girl's silly letter had but loosed the irritation of years. "'It's a beautiful meadow,' she remarked. It was one of those open-air drawing-rooms that have been formed hundreds of years ago, out of the smaller fields, so the boundary hedge zigzagged down the hill at right angles, and at the bottom there was a little green annex, a sort of powder-closet for the cows. "'Yes, the maidies well enough,' said Miss Avery, "'for those that is, who don't suffer from sneezing.' And she cackled maliciously. "'I've seen Charlie Wilcox go out to my lads in hay-time. Oh, they ought to do this. They mustn't do that. He'd learn them to be lads.' And just then the tickling took him. He has it from his father, with other things. "'There's not one Wilcox that can stand up against a field in June.' I laughed fit to burst while he was courting Ruth. "'My brother gets hay-fever, too.' said Margaret. This house lies too much on the land for them. Naturally they were glad enough to slip in at first. But Wilcoxes are better than nothing, as I see you found." Margaret laughed. "'They keep a place going, don't they?' "'Yes, it is just that.' "'They keep England going, it is my opinion.' But Miss Avery upset her by replying. "'Aye, they breed like rabbits. Well, well, it's a funny world. But he who made it knows what he wants in it, I suppose. If Mrs. Charlie is expecting her fourth, it isn't for us to repine." "'They breed, and they also work,' said Margaret, conscious of some invitation to disloyalty, which was echoed by the very breeze and by the songs of the birds. "'It certainly is a funny world, but so long as men like my husband and his sons govern it, I think it'll never be a bad one—never really bad." "'No, better a nothing,' said Miss Avery, and turned to the witch-elm. On their way back to the farm she spoke of her old friend much more clearly than before. In the house Margaret had wondered whether she quite distinguished the first wife from the second. Now she said, "'I never saw much of Ruth after her grandmother died, but we stayed civil. It was a very civil family. Old Mrs. Howard never spoke against anybody, nor let any one be turned away without food. Then it was never, "'Trespassers will be prosecuted, in their land. But would people please not come in?' Mrs. Howard was never created to run a farm." "'Had they no men to help them?' Margaret asked. Miss Avery replied, "'Things went on until there were no men.' 
until Mr. Wilcox came along," corrected Margaret, anxious that her husband should receive his dues. "'I suppose so. But Ruth should have married her. No disrespect to you to say this, for I take it you were intended to get Wilcox any way, whether she got him first or no." "'Whom should she have married?' "'A soldier,' exclaimed the old woman. "'Some real soldier.' Margaret was silent. It was a criticism of Henry's character far more trenchant than any of her own. She felt dissatisfied. "'But that's all over,' she went on. "'A better time is coming now, though you've kept me long enough waiting. In a couple of weeks I'll see your lights shining through the hedge of an evening. Have you ordered in coals?' "'We are not coming,' said Margaret firmly. She respected Miss Avery too much to humour her. "'No, not coming, never coming. It has all been a mistake. The furniture must be repacked at once, and I am very sorry. But I am making other arrangements, and must ask you to give me the keys." "'Certainly, Mrs. Wilcox,' said Miss Avery, and resigned her duties with a smile. Relieved at this conclusion, and having sent her compliments to Madge, Margaret walked back to the station. She had intended to go to the furniture warehouse and give directions for removal, but the muddle had turned out more extensive than she expected, so she decided to consult Henry. It was as well that she did this. He was strongly against employing the local man whom he had previously recommended, and advised her to store in London after all. But before this could be done, an unexpected trouble fell upon her. End of chapter 33 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 34 It was not unexpected entirely. Aunt Julie's health had been bad all the winter. She had had a long series of colds and coughs, and had been too busy to get rid of them. She had scarcely promised her niece, "'To really take my tiresome chest in hand,' when she caught a chill and developed acute pneumonia. Margaret and Tibby went down to Swanage. Helen was telegraphed for, and that spring party that after all gathered in that hospitable house had all the pathos of fair memories. On a perfect day, when the sky seemed blue porcelain, and the waves of the discreet little bay beat gentlest of tattoos upon the sand, Margaret hurried up through the rhododendrons, confronted again by the senselessness of death. One death may explain itself, but it throws no light upon another. The groping inquiry must begin anew. Preachers or scientists may generalize, but we know that no generality is possible about those whom we love. Not one heaven awaits them, not even one oblivion. Aunt Julie, incapable of tragedy, slipped out of life with odd little laughs and apologies for having stopped in it so long. She was very weak. She could not rise to the occasion, or realize the great mystery which all agree must await her. It only seemed to her that she was quite done up, more done up than ever before, that she saw and heard and felt less every moment and that, unless something changed, she would soon feel nothing. Her spare strength she devoted to plans. Could not Margaret take some steamer expeditions? Were mackerel cooked as Tibby liked them? She worried herself about Helen's absence, and also that she could be the cause of Helen's return. The nurses seemed to think such interests quite natural, and perhaps hers was an average approach to the great gate. But Margaret saw death stripped of any false romance. Whatever the idea of death may contain, the process can be trivial and hideous. "'Important! Margaret, dear, take the Lulworth when Helen comes.' "'Helen won't be able to stop, Aunt Julie. She has telegraphed that she can only get away just to see you. She must go back to Germany as soon as you are well.' "'How very odd of Helen! Mr. Wilcox. Yes, dear. Can he spare you? Henry wished her to come, and had been very kind. Yet again Margaret said so. Mrs. Munt did not die. Quite outside her will, a more dignified power took hold of her, and checked her on the downward slope. She returned, without emotion, as fidgety as ever. On the fourth day she was out of danger. Margaret! Important! it went on. I should like you to have some companion to take walks with. Do try Miss Conder. 
I have been a little walk with Miss Conder. But she is not really interesting. If only you had Helen. I have Tibby, Aunt Julie. No, but he has to do his Chinese. Some real companion is what you need. Really, Helen is odd. Helen is odd, very, agreed Margaret. Not content with going abroad, why does she want to go back there at once? No doubt she will change her mind when she sees us. She has not the least balance. That was the stock criticism about Helen. But Margaret's voice trembled as she made it. By now she was deeply pained at her sister's behaviour. It may be unbalanced to fly out of England, but to stop away eight months argues that the heart is awry as well as the head. A sick bed could recall Helen, but she was deaf to more human calls. After a glimpse at her aunt, she would retire into her nebulous life behind some post restant. She scarcely existed. Her letters had become dull and infrequent. She had no wants and no curiosity. And it was all put down to poor Henry's account. Henry, long pardoned by his wife, was still too infamous to be greeted by his sister-in-law. It was morbid, and, to her alarm, Margaret fancied that she could trace the growth of morbidity back in Helen's life for nearly four years. The flight from Oniton, the unbalanced patronage of the Basts, the explosion of grief up on the Downs, all connected with Paul, an insignificant boy, whose lips had kissed hers for a fraction of time. Margaret and Mrs. Wilcox had feared that they might kiss again. Foolishly. The real danger was reaction. Reaction against the Wilcoxes had eaten into her life until she was scarcely sane. At twenty-five she had an idée fix. What hope was there for her as an old woman? The more Margaret thought about it, the more alarmed she became. For many months she had put the subject away, but it was too big to be slighted now. There was almost a taint of madness. Were all Helen's actions to be governed by a tiny mishap, such as may happen to any young man or woman? Can human nature be constructed on lines so insignificant? The blundering little encounter at Howard's End was vital. It propagated itself where graver intercourse lay barren. It was stronger than sisterly intimacy, stronger than reason or books. In one of her moods Helen had confessed that she still enjoyed it in a certain sense. Paul had faded, but the magic of his caress endured. And where there is enjoyment of the past, there may also be reaction, propagation at both ends. Well, it is odd and sad that our minds should be such seed-beds, and we without power to choose the seed. But man is an odd, sad creature as yet, intent on pilfering the earth, and heedless of the growths within himself. He cannot be bored about psychology. He leaves it to the specialist, which is as if he should leave his dinner to be eaten by a steam-engine. He cannot be bothered to digest his own soul. Margaret and Helen have been more patient, and it is suggested that Margaret has succeeded, so far as success is yet possible. She does understand herself. She has some rudimentary control over her own growth. Whether Helen has succeeded, one cannot say. The day that Mrs. Munt rallied, Helen's letter arrived. She had posted it at Munich, and would be in London herself on the morrow. It was a disquieting letter, though the opening was affectionate and sane. Dearest Meg, give Helen's love to Aunt Julie. Tell her that I love, and have loved her, ever since I can remember. I shall be in London Thursday. My address will be care of the bankers. I have not yet settled on a hotel. So write or wire to me there, and give me detailed news. If Aunt Julie is much better, or if, for a terrible reason, it would be no good my coming down to Swanage, you must not think it odd if I do not come. I have all sorts of plans in my head. I am living abroad at present, and want to get back as quickly as possible. Will you please tell me where our furniture is? I should like to take out one or two books. The rest are for you." Forgive me, dearest Meg. This must read like rather a tiresome letter, but all letters are from your loving Helen. It was a tiresome letter, for it tempted Margaret to tell a lie. If she wrote that Aunt Julie was still in danger, her sister would come. 
unhealthiness is contagious. We cannot be in contact with those who are in a morbid state without ourselves deteriorating. To act for the best might do Helen good, but would do herself harm. And, at the risk of disaster, she kept her colours flying a little longer. She replied that their aunt was much better, and awaited developments. Tibby approved of her reply. Mellowing rapidly, he was a pleasanter companion than before. Oxford had done much for him. He had lost his peevishness, and could hide his indifference to people and his interest in food. But he had not grown more human. The years between eighteen and twenty-two, so magical for most, were leading him gently from boyhood to middle age. He had never known young manliness, that quality which warms the heart till death, and gives Mr. Wilcox an imperishable charm. He was frigid, through no fault of his own, and without cruelty. He thought Helen wrong, and Margaret right, but the family trouble was for him what a scene behind footlights is for most people. He had only one suggestion to make, and that was characteristic. "'Why don't you tell Mr. Wilcox?' "'About Helen?' "'Perhaps he has come across that sort of thing.' "'He would do all he could, but—' "'Oh, you know best. But he is practical.' It was the student's belief in experts. Margaret demurred for one or two reasons. Presently Helen's answer came. She sent a telegram requesting the address of the furniture, as she would now return at once. Margaret replied, "'Certainly not. Meet me at the banker's at four. She and Tibby went up to London. Helen was not at the banker's, and they were refused her address. Helen had passed into chaos. Margaret put her arm round her brother. He was all that she had left, and never had he seemed more unsubstantial. "'Tibby, love, what next?' He replied, "'It is extraordinary.' "'Dear, your judgment's often clearer than mine. Have you any notion what's at the back?' "'None. Unless it's something mental.' "'Oh, that,' said Margaret. "'Quite impossible.' But the suggestion had been uttered, and in a few minutes she took it up herself. Nothing else explained. And London agreed with Tibby. The mask fell off the city, and she saw it for what it really is—a caricature of infinity. The familiar barriers, the streets along which she moved, the houses between which she had made her little journeys for so many years, became negligible suddenly. Helen seemed one with grimy trees, and the traffic, and the slowly flowing slabs of mud. She had accomplished a hideous act of renunciation, and returned to the one. Margaret's own faith held firm. She knew the human soul will be merged, if it be merged at all with the stars and the sea. Yet she felt that her sister had been going amiss for many years. It was symbolic the catastrophe should come now, on a London afternoon, while rain fell slowly. Henry was the only hope. Henry was definite. He might know of some paths in the chaos that were hidden from them, and she determined to take Tibby's advice and lay the whole matter in his hands. They must call at his office. He could not well make it worse. She went for a few moments into St. Paul's, whose dome stands out of the welter so bravely, as if preaching the gospel of form. But within, St. Paul's is as its surroundings, echoes and whispers, inaudible songs, invisible mosaics, wet footmarks crossing and recrossing the floor. Si monumentum requiris circumspice. It points us back to London. There was no hope of Helen here. Henry was unsatisfactory at first. That she had expected. He was overjoyed to see her back from Swanage, and slow to admit the growth of a new trouble. When they told him of their search, he only chaffed Tibby and the Schlegels generally, and declared that it was just like Helen to lead her relatives a dance. "'That is what we all say,' replied Margaret. "'But why should it be just like Helen? Why should she be allowed to be so queer, and to grow queerer?' "'Don't ask me. I'm a plain man of business. I live and let live. My advice to you both is, don't worry. Margaret, you've got black marks again under your eyes. You know that's strictly forbidden. First your aunt, then your sister. No, we aren't going to have it. Are we, Tybalt? 
He rang the bell. "'I'll give you some tea, and then you go straight to Ducie Street. I can't have my girl looking as old as her husband.' "'All the same, you have not quite seen our point,' said Tibby. Mr. Wilcox, who was in good spirits, retorted, "'I don't suppose I have a shell.' He leant back, laughing at the gifted but ridiculous family, while the fire flickered over the map of Africa. Margaret motioned to her brother to go on. Rather diffident, he obeyed her. "'Margaret's point is this,' he said. "'Our sister may be mad.' Charles, who was working in the inner room, looked round. "'Come in, Charles,' said Margaret kindly. "'Could you help us at all? We are again in trouble.' "'I'm afraid I cannot. What are the facts? We are all mad, more or less, you know, in these days.' "'The facts are as follows,' replied Tibby, who had at times a pedantic lucidity. "'The facts are that she has been in England for three days, and will not see us. She has forbidden the bankers to give us her address. She refuses to answer questions. Margaret finds her letters colourless. There are other facts, but these are the most striking.' "'She has never behaved like this before, then?' asked Henry. "'Of course not,' said his wife, with a frown. "'Well, my dear, how am I to know?' A senseless spasm of annoyance came over her. "'You know quite well that Helen never sins against affection,' she said. "'You must have noticed that much in her, surely.' "'Oh, yes, she and I have always hit it off together.' "'No, Henry, can't you see—' I don't mean that." She recovered herself, but not before Charles had observed her. Stupid and attentive, he was watching the scene. I was meaning that when she was eccentric in the past, one could trace it back to the heart in the long run. She behaved oddly because she cared for some one, or wanted to help them. There's no possible excuse for her now. She is grieving us deeply, and that is why I am sure that she is not well. Mad is too terrible a word, but she is not well. I shall never believe it. I shouldn't discuss my sister with you if I thought she was well. Trouble you about her, I mean." Henry began to grow serious. Ill health was to him something perfectly definite. Generally well himself, he could not realize that we sink to it by slow gradations. The sick had no rights. They were outside the pale. One could lie to them remorselessly. When his first wife was seized, he had promised to take her down to Hertfordshire, but meanwhile arranged with a nursing home instead. Helen, too, was ill. And the plan that he sketched out for her capture, clever and well-meaning as it was, drew its ethics from the wolf-pack. "'You want to get hold of her?' he said. "'That's the problem, isn't it? She has got to see a doctor.' For all I know, she has seen one already. Yes, yes, don't interrupt. He rose to his feet, and thought intently. The genial, tentative host disappeared, and they saw instead the man who had carved money out of Greece and Africa, and bought forests from the natives for a few bottles of gin. I've got it, he said at last. It's perfectly easy. Leave it to me. We'll send her down to Howard's End. How will you do that? After her books. Tell her that she must unpack them herself. Then you can meet her there." "'But, Henry, that's just what she won't let me do. It's part of her, whatever it is, never to see me. Of course you won't tell her you're going. When she is there, looking at the cases, you'll just stroll in. If nothing is wrong with her, so much the better. But there'll be the motor round the corner, and we can run her up to a specialist in no time." Margaret shook her head. It's quite impossible. Why? It doesn't seem impossible to me, said Tibby. It is surely a very tippy plan. It is impossible because, she looked at her husband sadly, it's not the particular language that Helen and I talk if you see my meaning. It would do splendidly for other people whom I don't blame. But Helen doesn't talk, said Tibby. That's our whole difficulty. She won't talk your particular language, and on that account you think she's ill." "'No, Henry. It's sweet of you, but I couldn't." "'I see,' he said. "'You have scruples.' "'I suppose so. And sooner than go against them you would have your sister suffer. You could have got her down to Swanage by a word, 
but you had scruples. And scruples are all very well. I am as scrupulous as any man alive, I hope. But when it is a case like this, when there is a question of madness, I deny its madness. You said just now, it's madness when I say it, but not when you say it. Henry shrugged his shoulders. Margaret, Margaret, he groaned. No education can teach a woman logic. Now, my dear, my time is valuable. Do you want me to help you or not? Not in that way. Answer my question. Plain question, plain answer. Do— Charles surprised them by interrupting. Pater, we may as well keep Howard's end out of it, he said. Why, Charles? Charles could give no reason. But Margaret felt as if, over tremendous distance, a salutation had passed between them. "'The whole house is at sixes and sevens,' he said crossly. "'We don't want any more mess.' "'Who's we?' asked his father. "'My boy, pray, who's we?' "'I am sure I beg your pardon,' said Charles. "'I appear always to be intruding.' By now Margaret wished she had never mentioned her trouble to her husband. Retreat was impossible. He was determined to push the matter to a satisfactory conclusion, and Helen faded as he talked. Her fair flying hair and eager eyes counted for nothing, for she was ill, without rights, and any of her friends might hunt her. Sick at heart, Margaret joined in the chase. She wrote her sister a lying letter, at her husband's dictation. She said the furniture was all at Howard's end, but could be seen on Monday next at 3 p.m., when a charwoman would be in attendance. It was a cold letter, and the more plausible for that. Helen would think she was offended. And on Monday next she and Henry went to lunch with Dolly, and then ambushed themselves in the garden. After they had gone, Mr. Wilcox said to his son, "'I can't have this sort of behaviour, my boy. Margaret's too sweet-natured to mind.' but I mind for her." Charles made no answer. "'Is anything wrong with you, Charles, this afternoon?' "'No, Pater. But he may be taking on a bigger business than you reckon.' "'How?' "'Don't ask me.'" End of chapter 34 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 35 one speaks of the moods of spring, but the days that are her true children have only one mood. They are all full of the rising and dropping of winds, and the whistling of birds. New flowers may come out, the green embroidery of the hedges increase, but the same heaven broods overhead, soft, thick, and blue. The same figures, seen and unseen, are wandering by coppice and meadow. The morning that Margaret had spent with Miss Avery, and the afternoon she set out to entrap Helen, were the scales of a single balance. Time might never have moved, rain never have fallen, and man alone, with his schemes and ailments, was troubling nature, until he saw her through a veil of tears. She protested no more. Whether Henry was right or wrong, he was most kind, and she knew of no other standard by which to judge him. She must trust him absolutely. As soon as he had taken up a business— his obtuseness vanished. He profited by the slightest indications, and the capture of Helen promised to be staged as deftly as the marriage of Evie. They went down in the morning as arranged, and he discovered that their victim was actually in Hilton. On his arrival he called at all the livery stables in the village, and had a few minutes' serious conversation with the proprietors. What he said Margaret did not know, perhaps not the truth, but news arrived after lunch that a lady had come by the London train, and had taken a fly to Howard's End. "'She was bound to drive,' said Henry. "'There will be her books.' "'I cannot make it out,' said Margaret, for the hundredth time. "'Finish your coffee, dear. We must be off.' "'Yes, Margaret. You know you must take plenty,' said Dolly. Margaret tried, but suddenly lifted her hand to her eyes. Dolly stole glances at her father-in-law, which he did not answer. In the silence the motor came round to the door. "'You're not fit for it,' he said anxiously. "'Let me go alone. I know exactly what to do.' "'Oh, yes, I am fit,' said Margaret, uncovering her face. "'Only most frightfully worried. I cannot feel that Helen is really alive. 
Her letters and telegrams seem to have come from someone else. Her voice isn't in them. I don't believe your driver really saw her at the station. I wish I'd never mentioned it. I know that Charles is vexed. Yes, he is. She seized Dolly's hand and kissed it. There. Dolly will forgive me. There. Now we'll be off. Henry had been looking at her closely. He did not like this breakdown. "'Don't you want to tidy yourself?' he asked. "'Have I time?' "'Yes, plenty.' She went to the lavatory by the front door, and as soon as the bolt slipped, Mr. Wilcox said quietly, "'Dolly, I'm going without her.' Dolly's eyes lit up with vulgar excitement. She followed him on tiptoe out to the car. "'Tell her I thought it best.' "'Yes, Mr. Wilcox, I see.' "'Say anything you like.' "'All right.' The car started well, and with ordinary luck would have got away. But Porgly Woggles, who was playing in the garden, chose this moment to sit down in the middle of the path. Crane, in trying to pass him, ran one wheel over a bed of wallflowers. Dolly screamed. Margaret, hearing the noise, rushed out hatless, and was in time to jump on the footboard. She said not a single word. He was only treating her as she had treated Helen, and her rage at his dishonesty only helped to indicate what Helen would feel against them. She thought, I deserve it. I am punished for lowering my colours. And she accepted his apologies with a calmness that astonished him. I still consider you are not fit for it, he kept saying. Perhaps I was not at lunch, but the whole thing is spread clearly before me now. I was meaning to act for the best. Just lend me your scarf, will you? This wind takes one's hair so. Certainly, dear girl. Are you all right now? Look, my hands have stopped trembling. And have quite forgiven me? Then listen. Her cab should already have arrived at Howard's End. We're a little late, but no matter. Our first move will be to send it down to wait at the farm, as, if possible, one doesn't want a scene before servants. A certain gentleman, he pointed at Crane's back, won't drive in, but will wait a little short of the front gate, behind the laurels. Have you still the keys of the house? Yes. Well, they aren't wanted. Do you remember how the house stands? Yes. If we don't find her in the porch, we can stroll round into the garden. Our object—here they stopped to pick up the doctor. I was just saying to my wife, Mansbridge, that our main object is not to frighten Miss Schlegel. The house, as you know, is my property, so it should seem quite natural for us to be there. The trouble is evidently nervous. Wouldn't you say so, Margaret?" The doctor, a very young man, began to ask questions about Helen. Was she normal? Was there anything congenital or hereditary? Had anything occurred that was likely to alienate her from her family? Nothing, answered Margaret, wondering what would have happened if she had added, though she did resent my husband's immorality. "'She always was highly strung,' pursued Henry, leaning back in the car as it shot past the church. "'A tendency to spiritualism and those things, though nothing serious. Musical, literary, artistic. But I should say normal. A very charming girl.' Margaret's anger and terror increased every moment. How dare these men label her sister! What horrors lay ahead! What impertinences that shelter under the name of science! The pack was turning on Helen, to deny her human rights, and it seemed to Margaret that all Schlegels were threatened with her. Were they normal? What a question to ask! And it is always those who know nothing about human nature, who are bored by psychology and shocked by physiology, who ask it. However piteous her sister's state, she knew that she must be on her side. They would be mad together if the world chose to consider them so. It was now five minutes past three. The car slowed down by the farm, in the yard of which Miss Avery was standing. Henry asked her whether a cab had gone past. She nodded, and the next moment they caught sight of it at the end of the lane. The car ran silently like a beast of prey. So unsuspicious was Helen that she was sitting on the porch, with her back to the road. She had come. Only her head and shoulders were visible. She sat framed in the vine, and one of her hands played with the buds. The wind ruffled her hair, the sun glorified it. She was as she had always been. 
Margaret was seated next to the door. Before her husband could prevent her, she slipped out. She ran to the garden gate, which was shut, passed through it, and deliberately pushed it in his face. The noise alarmed Helen. Margaret saw her rise with an unfamiliar movement, and rushing into the porch, learnt the simple explanation of all their fears. Her sister was with child. "'Is the truant all right?' called Henry. She had time to whisper, "'Oh, my darling!' The keys of the house were in her hand. She unlocked Howard's end, and thrust Helen into it. "'Yes, all right!' she said, and stood with her back to the door. End of chapter 35 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 36 "'Margaret, you look upset,' said Henry. Mansbridge had followed. Crane was at the gate, and the flyman had stood up on the box. Margaret shook her head at them. She could not speak any more. She remained clutching the keys, as if all their future depended on them. Henry was asking more questions. She shook her head again. His words had no sense. She heard him wonder why she had let Helen in. "'You might have given me a knock with the gate,' was another of his remarks. Presently she heard herself speaking. She, or someone for her, said, "'Go away.' Henry came nearer. He repeated, "'Margaret, you look upset again. My dear, give me the keys. What are you doing with Helen?' "'Oh, dearest, do go away, and I will manage it all.' "'Manage what?' He stretched out his hand for the keys. She might have obeyed, if it had not been for the doctor. "'Stop that, at least,' she said piteously. The doctor had turned back, and was questioning the driver of Helen's cab. A new feeling came over her. She was fighting for women against men. She did not care about rights, but if men came into Howard's End, it should be over her body." "'Come, this is an old beginning,' said her husband. The doctor came forward now, and whispered two words to Mr. Wilcox. The scandal was out. Sincerely horrified, Henry stood gazing at the earth. "'I cannot help it,' said Margaret. "'Do wait. It's not my fault. Please, all four of you, to go away now.' Now the flyman was whispering to Crane. "'We are relying on you to help us, Mrs. Wilcox,' said the young doctor. Could you go in and persuade your sister to come out?" "'On what grounds?' said Margaret, suddenly looking him straight in the eyes. Thinking it professional to prevaricate, he murmured something about a nervous breakdown. "'I beg your pardon, but it is nothing of the sort. You are not qualified to attend my sister, Mr. Mansbridge. If we require your services, we will let you know.' "'I can diagnose the case more bluntly, if you wish,' he retorted. You could, but you have not. You are, therefore, not qualified to attend my sister." "'Come, come, Margaret,' said Henry, never raising his eyes. "'This is a terrible business, an appalling business. It's doctor's orders. Open the door.' "'Forgive me, but I will not.' "'I don't agree.' Margaret was silent. "'This business is as broad as it is long,' contributed the doctor. We had better all work together. You need us, Mrs. Wilcox, and we need you." "'Quite so,' said Henry. "'I do not need you in the least,' said Margaret. The two men looked at each other anxiously. "'No more does my sister, who is still many weeks from her confinement.' "'Margaret! Margaret! Well, Henry, send your doctor away. What possible use is he now?' Mr. Wilcox ran his eye over the house. He had a vague feeling that he must stand firm and support the doctor. He himself might need support, for there was trouble ahead. "'It all turns on affection now,' said Margaret. "'Affection! Don't you see?' Resuming her usual methods, she wrote the word on the house with her finger. "'Surely, you see, I like Helen very much. You, not so much. Mr. Mansbridge doesn't know her. That's all.' And affection, when reciprocated, gives rights. Put that down in your notebook, Mr. Mansbridge. It's a useful formula." Henry told her to be calm. "'You don't know what you want yourselves,' said Margaret, folding her arms. "'For one sensible remark I will let you in. But you cannot make it. You would trouble my sister for no reason. 
I will not permit it. I'll stand here all the day sooner." Mansbridge, said Henry, in a low voice, perhaps not now. The pack was breaking up. At a sign from his master, Crane also went back into the car. Now, Henry, you, she said gently. None of her bitterness had been directed at him. Go away now, dear. I shall want your advice later, no doubt. Forgive me if I have been cross. But seriously, you must go." He was too stupid to leave her. Now it was Mr. Mansbridge who called in a low voice to him. "'I shall soon find you down at Dolly's,' she called. As the gate at last clanged between them. The fly moved out of the way, the motor backed, turned a little, backed again, and turned in the narrow road. A string of farm carts came up in the middle, but she waited through all, for there was no hurry. When all was over and the car had started, she opened the door. "'Oh, my darling,' she said, "'my darling, forgive me!' Helen was standing in the hall. End of chapter 36 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 37 Margaret bolted the door on the inside. Then she would have kissed her sister, but Helen, in a dignified voice that came strangely from her, said, "'Convenient. You did not tell me that the books were unpacked. I have found nearly everything that I want.' "'I told you nothing that was true.' "'It has been a great surprise, certainly. Has Aunt Julie been ill?' "'Helen, you wouldn't think I'd invent that.' "'I suppose not.' said Helen, turning away and crying a very little. But one loses faith in everything after this. We thought it was illness, but even then, I haven't behaved worthily. Helen selected another book. I ought not to have consulted any one. What would our father have thought of me? She did not think of questioning her sister, nor of rebuking her. Both might be necessary in the future. But she had first to purge a greater crime than any that Helen could have committed, that want of confidence that is the work of the devil. "'Yes, I am annoyed,' replied Helen. "'My wishes should have been respected. I would have gone through this meeting if it was necessary, but after Aunt Julie recovered it was not necessary. Planning my life as I now have to do—' "'Come away from those books,' called Margaret. "'Helen, do talk to me.' I was just saying that I have stopped living haphazard. One can't go through a great deal of—she missed out the noun—without planning one's actions in advance. I am going to have a child in June. And in the first place, conversations, discussions, excitement, are not good for me. I will go through them if necessary, but only then. In the second place, I have no right to trouble people. I cannot fit in with England as I know it. I have done something that the English never pardon. It would not be right for them to pardon it. So I must live where I am not known." "'But why didn't you tell me, dearest?' "'Yes,' replied Helen, judicially. "'I might have, but decided to wait.' "'I believe you would never have told me.' "'Oh, yes, I should. We have taken a flat in Munich.' Margaret glanced out of window. "'By we I mean myself and Monica. But for her, I am, and have been, and always wish to be, alone. I have not heard of Monica. You wouldn't have. She's an Italian, by birth at least. She makes her living by journalism. I met her originally on Garda. Monica is much the best person to see me through. You are very fond of her, then? She has been extraordinarily sensible with me. Margaret guessed at Monica's type. Italiano Inglesiato, they had named it, the crude feminist of the South, whom one respects but avoids, and Helen had turned to it in her need. "'You must not think that we shall never meet,' said Helen, with a measured kindness. "'I shall always have a room for you when you can be spared, and the longer that you can be with me, the better. But you haven't understood yet, Meg, and of course it is very difficult for you. This is a shock to you. It isn't to me.' who have been thinking over our futures for many months, and they won't be changed by a slight contretemps such as this. I cannot live in England." 
Helen, you've not forgiven me for my treachery. You couldn't talk like this to me if you had. Oh, Meg, dear, why do we talk at all? She dropped a book and sighed wearily. Then, recovering herself, she said, Tell me, how is it that all the books are down here? A series of mistakes. And a great deal of the furniture has been unpacked. All. Who lives here, then? No one. I suppose you are letting it, though. The house is dead, said Margaret, with a frown. Why worry on about it? But I am interested. You talk as if I had lost all my interest in life. I am still Helen, I hope. Now this hasn't the feel of a dead house. The hall seems more alive even than in the old days, when it held the Wilcox's own things. Interested, are you? Very well, I must tell you, I suppose. My husband lent it, on condition we— But by a mistake all our things were unpacked, and Miss Avery, instead of— She stopped. Look here, I can't go on like this. I warn you, I won't. Helen, why should you be so miserably unkind to me, simply because you hate Henry? I don't hate him now, said Helen. I have stopped being a schoolgirl. And, Meg, once again, I am not being unkind. But as for fitting in with your English life, no, put it out of your head at once. Imagine a visit from me at Ducie Street. It's unthinkable. Margaret could not contradict her. It was appalling to see her quietly moving forward with her plans, not bitter or excitable, neither asserting innocence nor confessing guilt, merely desiring freedom and the company of those who would not blame her. She had been through—how much? Margaret did not know. But it was enough to part her from old habits as well as old friends. "'Tell me about yourself,' said Helen, who had chosen her books and was lingering over the furniture. "'There's nothing to tell.' "'But your marriage has been happy, Meg?' "'Yes. But I don't feel inclined to talk.' "'You feel as I do.' "'Not that. But I can't.' No more can I. It is a nuisance, but no good trying. Something had come between them. Perhaps it was society, which henceforward would exclude Helen. Perhaps it was a third life, already potent as a spirit. They could find no meeting-place. Both suffered acutely, and were not comforted by the knowledge that affection survived. Look here, Meg, is the coast clear? You mean that you want to go away from me? I suppose so. Dear old lady, it isn't any use. I knew we should have nothing to say. Give my love to Aunt Julie and Tibby, and take more yourself than I can say. Promise to come and see me in Munich later. Certainly, dearest. For that is all we can do. It seemed so. Most ghastly of all was Helen's common sense. Monica had been extraordinarily good for her. I am glad to have seen you and the things. She looked at the bookcase lovingly, as if she was saying farewell to the past. Margaret unbolted the door. She remarked, The car has gone, and here's your cab. She led the way to it, glancing at the leaves in the sky. The spring had never seemed more beautiful. The driver, who was leaning on the gate, called out, Please, lady, a message, and handed her Henry's visiting card through the bars. "'How did this come?' she asked. Crane had returned with it almost at once. She read the card with annoyance. It was covered with instructions in domestic French. When she and her sister had talked, she was to come back for the night to Dolly's. "'Il faut dormir sur ce sujet.' While Helen was to be found, une confortable chambre à l'hôtel. The final sentence displeased her greatly, until she remembered that the Charleses had only one spare room, and so could not invite a third guest. "'Henry would have done what he could,' she interpreted. Helen had not followed her into the garden. The door once open, she lost her inclination to fly. She remained in the hall, going from bookcase to table. She grew more like the old Helen, irresponsible and charming. "'This is Mr. Wilcox's house,' she inquired. Surely you remember Howard's end. Remember? I, who remember everything. 
but it looks to be ours now." "'Miss Avery was extraordinary,' said Margaret, her own spirits lightening a little. Again she was invaded by a slight feeling of disloyalty. But it brought her relief, and she yielded to it. She loved Mrs. Wilcox, and would rather furnish her house with our things than think of it empty. In consequence, here are all the library books. Not all the books. She hasn't unpacked the art books, in which she may show her sense. And we never used to have the sword here. The sword looks well, though. Magnificent. Yes, doesn't it? Where's the piano, Meg? I warehoused that in London. Why? Nothing. Curious, too, that the carpet fits. The carpet's a mistake, announced Helen. I know that we had it in London, but this floor ought to be bare. It is far too beautiful. You still have a mania for underfurnishing. Would you care to come into the dining room before you start? There's no carpet there. They went in, and each minute their talk became more natural. Oh, what a place for Mother Chiffonnier! cried Helen. Look at the chairs, though. Oh, look at them. Wickham Place faced north, didn't it? Northwest. Anyhow, it is thirty years since any of those chairs have felt the sun. Feel. Their little backs are quite warm. But why has Miss Avery made them set to partners? I shall just— Over here, Meg. Put it so that anyone sitting will see the lawn. Margaret moved a chair. Helen sat down in it. Yes. The window's too high. Try a drawing-room chair. No, I don't like the drawing-room so much. The beam has been matchboarded. It would have been so beautiful otherwise. Helen, what a memory you have for some things! You're perfectly right. It's a room that men have spoilt through trying to make it nice for women. Men don't know what we want. And never will. I don't agree. In two thousand years, they'll know. But the chairs show up wonderfully. Look where Tibby spilt the soup. Coffee. It was coffee, surely. Helen shook her head. Impossible. Tibby was far too young to be given coffee at that time. Was father alive? Yes. Then you're right, and it must have been soup. I was thinking of much later, that unsuccessful visit of Aunt Julie's, when she didn't realize that Tibby had grown up. It was coffee then, for he threw it down on purpose. There was some rhyme, tea, coffee, coffee, tea, that she said to him every morning at breakfast. Wait a minute, how did it go? I know. No, I don't. What a detestable boy Tibby was! But the rhyme was simply awful. No decent person could have put up with it. Ah, oh, that green-gauge tree! cried Helen, as if the garden was also part of their childhood. Why do I connect it with dumbbells? And there come the chickens. The grass wants cutting. I love yellow hammers. Margaret interrupted her. I have got it, she announced. Tea, tea, coffee, tea, or chocolate tea. That every morning for three weeks. No wonder Tibby was wild. Tibby is moderately a dear now, said Helen. There, I knew you'd say that in the end. Of course he's a dear. A bell rang. Listen, what's that? Helen said. Perhaps the Wilcoxes are beginning the siege. What nonsense! Listen. And the triviality faded from their faces, though it left something behind, the knowledge that they could never be parted because their love was rooted in common things. Explanations and appeals had failed. They had tried for a common meeting-ground, and had only made each other unhappy. And all the time their salvation was lying round them, the past sanctifying the present, the present with wild heart-throb, declaring that there would, after all, be a future, with laughter and the voices of children. Helen, still smiling, came up to her sister. She said, It is always Meg. They looked into each other's eyes. The inner life had paid. Solemnly the clapper told. No one was in the front. Margaret went to the kitchen and struggled between packing-cases to the window. Their visitor was only a little boy with a tin can. 
and triviality returned. "'Little boy, what do you want?' "'Please, I am the milk.' "'Did Miss Avery send you?' said Margaret, rather sharply. "'Yes, please. Then take it back, and say we require no milk.' While she called to Helen, "'No, it's not the siege, but possibly an attempt to provision us against one.' "'But I like milk,' cried Helen. "'Why send it away?' "'Do you?' "'Oh, very well. But we've nothing to put it in, and he wants the can.' "'Please, I'm to call in the morning for the can.' said the boy. "'The house will be locked up, then. In the morning would I bring eggs, too?' "'Are you the boy whom I saw playing in the stacks last week?' The child hung his head. "'Well, run away, and do it again.' "'Nice little boy,' whispered Helen. "'I say, what's your name? Mine's Helen.' "'Tom.' That was Helen all over. The Wilcoxes, too, would ask a child its name, but they never told their names in return. "'Tom, this one here is Margaret. And at home we've another called Tibby.' "'Mine a lop replied Tom, supposing Tibby to be a rabbit. "'You are a very good and rather clever little boy. Mind you come again.' "'Isn't he charming?' "'Undoubtedly,' said Margaret. He is probably the son of Madge, and Madge is dreadful. But this place has wonderful powers. What do you mean? <laughs> I don't know, because I probably agree with you. It kills what is dreadful, and makes what is beautiful live. I do agree, said Helen, as she sipped the milk. But you said that the house was dead not half an hour ago. Meaning that I was dead. I felt it. Yes, the house has a surer life than we, even if it was empty. And as it is, I can't get over that for thirty years the sun has never shone full in our furniture. After all, Wickham Place was a grave. Meg, I've a startling idea. What is it? Drink some milk to steady you. Margaret obeyed. No, I won't tell you yet, said Helen because you may laugh or be angry. Let's go upstairs first, and give the rooms an airing." They opened window after window, till the inside, too, was rustling to the spring. Curtains blew, picture-frames tapped cheerfully. Helen uttered cries of excitement as she found this bed obviously in its right place, that in its wrong one. She was angry with Miss Avery for not having moved the wardrobes up. Then one would see, really. She admired the view. She was the Helen who had written the memorable letters four years ago. As they leant out looking westward, she said, "'About my idea. Couldn't you and I camp out in this house for the night?' "'I don't think we could well do that,' said Margaret. "'Here are beds, tables, towels. I know, but the house isn't supposed to be slept in. And Henry's suggestion was, "'I require no suggestions. I shall not alter anything in my plans.' But it would give me so much pleasure to have one night here with you. It will be something to look back on. Oh, Meg, lovey, do let's. But Helen, my pet, said Margaret, we can't without getting Henry's leave. Of course he would give it, but you said yourself that you couldn't visit at Ducie Street now, and this is equally intimate. Ducie Street is his house. This is ours. Our furniture, our sort of people coming to the door. Do let us camp out, just one night, and Tom shall feed us on eggs and milk. Why not? It's a moon." Margaret hesitated. "'I feel Charles wouldn't like it,' she said at last. Even our furniture annoyed him, and I was going to clear it out, when Aunt Julie's illness prevented me. I sympathize with Charles. He feels it's his mother's house. He loves it in rather an untaking way. Henry I could answer for, not Charles. "'I know he won't like it,' said Helen. "'But I am going to pass out of their lives. What difference will it make in the long run if they say, "'And she even spent the night at Howard's End?' "'How do you know you'll pass out of their lives? We have thought that twice before.' "'Because my plans—which you change in a moment—' 
"'Then because my life is great, and theirs are little,' said Helen, taking fire. "'I know of things they can't know of, and so do you. We know that there's poetry. We know that there's death. They can only take them on hearsay. We know that this is our house, because it feels ours. Oh, they may take the title-deeds and the door-keys. But for this one night we are at home." "'It would be lovely to have you once more alone,' said Margaret. "'It may be a chance in a thousand. "'Yes, and we could talk.' She dropped her voice. "'It won't be a very glorious story. But under that witch-elm, honestly, I see little happiness ahead. Cannot I have this one night with you? I needn't say how much it would mean to me. Then let us. It is no good hesitating. Shall I drive down to Hilton now and get leave? Oh, we don't want leave. But Margaret was a loyal wife. In spite of imagination and poetry, perhaps on account of them, she could sympathize with the technical attitude that Henry would adopt. If possible, she would be technical, too. A night's lodging, and they demanded no more, need not involve the discussion of general principles. "'Charles may say no,' grumbled Helen. "'We shan't consult him.' "'Go, if you like. I should have stopped without leave.' It was the touch of selfishness, which was not enough to mar Helen's character, and even added to its beauty. She would have stopped without leave, and escaped to Germany the next morning. Margaret kissed her. "'Expect me back before dark. I am looking forward to it so much. It is like you to have thought of such a beautiful thing.' "'Not a thing. Only an ending,' said Helen, rather sadly, and the sense of tragedy closed in on Margaret again, as soon as she left the house. She was afraid of Miss Avery. It is disquieting to fulfil a prophecy, however superficially. She was glad to see no watching figure as she drove past the farm, but only little Tom, turning somersaults in the straw. End of chapter 37 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 38 The tragedy began quietly enough and, like many another talk, by the man's deft assertion of his superiority. Henry heard her arguing with the driver, stepped out and settled the fellow, who was inclined to be rude, and then led the way to some chairs on the lawn. Dolly, who had not been told, ran out with offers of tea. He refused them, and ordered her to wheel baby's perambulator away, as they desired to be alone. "'But the Dittums can't listen! He isn't nine months old!' she pleaded. "'That's not what I was saying,' retorted her father-in-law. Baby was wheeled out of earshot, and did not hear about the crisis till later years. It was now the turn of Margaret. "'Is it what we feared?' he asked. "'It is.' "'Dare girl,' he began, "'there is a troublesome business ahead of us, and nothing but the most absolute honesty and plain speech will see us through.' Margaret bent her head. I am obliged to question you on subjects we'd both prefer to leave untouched. As you know, I am not one of your Bernard Shaws who consider nothing sacred. To speak as I must will pain me. But there are occasions. We are husband and wife, not children. I am a man of the world, and you are a most exceptional woman." All Margaret's senses forsook her. She blushed and looked past him at the six hills, covered with spring herbage. Noting her colour, he grew still more kind. "'I see that you feel as I felt when—my poor little wife! Oh, be brave! Just one or two questions, and I have done with you. Was your sister wearing a wedding-ring?' Margaret stammered a—' "'No.' There was an appalling silence. "'Henry, I really came to ask a favour about Howard's end. One point at a time. I am now obliged to ask for the name of her seducer." She rose to her feet, and held the chair between them. Her colour had ebbed, and she was grey. It did not displease him that she should receive his question thus. "'Take your time,' he counselled her. "'Remember that this is far worse for me than for you.' She swayed. He feared she was going to faint. 
Then speech came, and she said slowly, Seducer. No, I do not know her seducer's name. Would she not tell you? I never even asked her who seduced her, said Margaret, dwelling on the hateful word thoughtfully. That is singular. Then he changed his mind. Natural, perhaps, dear girl, that she shouldn't ask. But until his name is known, nothing can be done. Sit down. How terrible it is to see you so upset. I knew you weren't fit for it. I wish I hadn't taken you." Margaret answered, "'I like to stand, if you don't mind, for it gives me a pleasant view of the six hills.' "'As you like.' "'Have you anything else to ask me, Henry?' "'Next you must tell me whether you have gathered anything. I have often noticed your insight, dear. I only wish my own was as good. You may have guessed something, even though your sister said nothing. The slightest hint would help us." "'Who is we?' "'I thought it best to ring up Charles.' "'That was unnecessary,' said Margaret, growing warmer. "'This news will give Charles disproportionate pain. He has at once gone to call on your brother.' "'That, too, was unnecessary. Let me explain, dear, how the matter stands. You don't think that I and my son are other than gentlemen. It is in Helen's interests that we are acting. It is still not too late to save her name." Then Margaret hid out for the first time. "'Are we to make a seducer marry her?' she asked. "'If possible, yes.' "'But, Henry, suppose he turned out to be married already. One has heard of such cases.' "'In that case he must pay heavily for his misconduct and be thrashed within an inch of his life." So her first blow missed. She was thankful of it. What had tempted her to imperil both of their lives? Henry's obtuseness had saved her as well as himself. Exhausted with anger, she sat down again, blinking at him as he told her as much as he thought fit. At last she said, "'May I ask you my question now?' "'Certainly, my dear. Tomorrow Helen goes to Munich. Well, possibly she is right. Henry, let a lady finish. Tomorrow she goes. Tonight, with your permission, she would like to sleep at Howard's End." It was the crisis of his life. Again she would have recalled the words as soon as they were uttered. She had not led up to them with sufficient care. She longed to warn him that they were far more important than he supposed. She saw him weighing them as if they were a business proposition. "'Why Howard's end?' he said at last. "'Would she not be more comfortable, as I suggested, at the hotel?' Margaret hastened to give him reasons. "'It is an odd request, but you know what Helen is and what women in her state are.' He frowned and moved irritably. "'She has the idea that one night in your house would give her pleasure and do her good. I think she's right. Being one of those imaginative girls, the presence of all our books and furniture soothes her. This is a fact. It is the end of her girlhood. Her last words to me were, A beautiful ending. She values the old furniture for sentimental reasons, in fact. Exactly. You have quite understood. It is her last hope of being with it. I don't agree there, my dear. Helen will have her share of the goods wherever she goes. Possibly more than her share, for you are so fond of her that you'd give her anything of yours that she fancies, wouldn't you? And I'd raise no objection. I could understand it, if it was her old home. Because a home, or a house—he changed the word designedly. He had thought of a telling point. Because a house in which one has lived becomes, in a sort of way, sacred. I don't know why. Associations, and so on. Now, Helen has no associations with Howard's End, though I and Charles and Evie have. I do not see why she wants to stay the night there. She will only catch cold." "'Leave it that you don't see,' cried Margaret. Call it fancy. But realize that fancy is a scientific fact. Helen is fanciful, and wants to." Then he surprised her, a rare occurrence. He shot an unexpected bolt. If she wants to sleep one night, she may want to sleep two. We shall never get her out of the house, perhaps." "'Well,' 
said Margaret, with the precipice in sight. "'And suppose we don't get her out of the house? Would it matter? She would do no one any harm.' Again the irritated gesture. "'No, Henry,' she panted, receding. "'I didn't mean that. We will only trouble Howard's End for this one night. I take her to London to-morrow.' "'Do you intend to sleep in a damp house, too?' "'She cannot be left alone.' "'That's quite impossible. Madness. You must be here to meet Charles.' I have already told you that your message to Charles was unnecessary, and I have no desire to meet him. Margaret! My Margaret! What has this business to do with Charles? If it concerns me little, it concerns you less, and Charles not at all. As the future owner of Howard's End, said Mr. Wilcox, arching his fingers, I should say that it did concern Charles. In what way? Will Helen's condition depreciate the property? My dear, you are forgetting yourself. I think you yourself recommended plain speaking." They looked at each other in amazement. The precipice was at their feet now. "'Helen commands my sympathy,' said Henry. "'As your husband, I shall do all for her that I can, and I have no doubt that she will prove more sinned against than sinning. But I cannot treat her as if nothing has happened. I should be false to my position in society if I did. She controlled herself for the last time. "'No, let us go back to Helen's request,' she said. "'It is unreasonable, but the request of an unhappy girl. To-morrow she will go to Germany, and trouble society no longer. To-night she asks to sleep in your empty house, a house which you do not care about, and which you have not occupied for over a year. May she? Will you give my sister leave? Will you forgive her?' as you hope to be forgiven, and as you have actually been forgiven. Forgive her for one night only. That will be enough." "'As I have actually been forgiven? Never mind for the moment what I mean by that,' said Margaret. Answer my question." Perhaps some hint of her meaning did dawn on him. If so, he blotted it out. Straight from his fortress he answered, "'I seem rather unaccommodating. But I have some experience of life, and know how one thing leads to another. I am afraid that your sister had better sleep at the hotel. I have my children and the memory of my dear wife to consider. I am sorry, but see that she leaves my house at once." You mentioned Mrs. Wilcox. I beg your pardon. A rare occurrence. In reply, may I mention Mrs. Bast? You have not been yourself all day said Henry, and rose from his seat with face unmoved. Margaret rushed at him, and seized both his hands. She was transfigured. "'Not any more of this,' she cried. "'You shall see the connection, if it kills you, Henry. You have had a mistress. I forgave you. My sister has a lover. You drive her from the house. Do you see the connection? Stupid, hypocritical, cruel, oh, contemptible! A man who insults his wife when she's alive, and cants with her memory when she's dead. A man who ruins a woman for his pleasure, and casts her off to ruin other men. And gives bad financial advice, and then says he is not responsible. These, man, are you. You can't recognize them, because you cannot connect. I've had enough of your unweeded kindness. I've spoilt you long enough. All your life you have been spoiled. Mrs. Wilcox spoiled you. No one has ever told you what you are. Muddled, criminally muddled. Men like you use repentance as a blind, so don't repent. Only say to yourself, what Helen has done, I've done. The, the two cases are different, Henry stammered. His real retort was not quite ready. His brain was still in a whirl, and he wanted a little longer. In what way different? You have betrayed Mrs. Wilcox. Helen only herself. You remain in society. Helen can't. You have had only pleasure. She may die. You have the insolence to talk to me of differences, Henry." Oh, the uselessness of it! Henry's retort came. I perceive you are attempting blackmail. It is scarcely a pretty weapon for a wife to use against her husband. My rule through life has been never to pay the least attention to threats. And I can only repeat what I said before. 
I do not give you and your sister leave to sleep at Howard's End." Margaret loosed his hands. He went into the house, wiping first one and then the other on his handkerchief. For a little she stood looking at the six hills, tombs of warriors, breasts of the spring. Then she passed out into what was now the evening. End of chapter 38 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 39 Charles and Tibby met at Ducie Street, where the latter was staying. Their interview was short and absurd. They had nothing in common but the English language, and tried by its help to express what neither of them understood. Charles saw in Helen the family foe. He had singled her out as the most dangerous of the Schlegels, and angry as he was, looked forward to telling his wife how right he had been. His mind was made up at once. The girl must be got out of the way before she disgraced them farther. If occasion offered, she might be married to a villain, or, possibly, to a fool. But this was a concession to morality. It formed no part of his main scheme. Honest and hearty was Charles's dislike, and the past spread itself out very clearly before him. Hatred is a skilful compositor. As if they were heads in a notebook, he ran through all the incidents of the Schlegel's campaign, the attempt to compromise his brother, his mother's legacy, his father's marriage, the introduction of the furniture, the unpacking of the same. He had not yet heard of the request to sleep at Howard's End, that was to be their master stroke and the opportunity for his. But he already felt that Howard's End was the objective, and, though he disliked the house, was determined to defend it. Tibby, on the other hand, had no opinions. He stood above the conventions. His sister had a right to do what she thought right. It is not difficult to stand above the conventions when we leave no hostages among them. Men can always be more unconventional than women, and a bachelor of independent means need encounter no difficulties at all. Unlike Charles, Tibby had money enough. His ancestors had earned it for him. And if he shocked the people in one set of lodgings, he had only to move into another. His was the leisure without sympathy an attitude as fatal as the strenuous. A little cold culture may be raised on it, but no art. His sisters had seen the family danger, and had never forgotten to discount the gold islets that raised them from the sea. Tibby gave all the praise to himself, and so despised the struggling and the submerged. Hence the absurdity of the interview. The gulf between them was economic as well as spiritual. But several facts passed. Charles pressed for them with an impertinence that the undergraduate could not withstand. On what date had Helen gone abroad? To whom? Charles was anxious to fasten the scandal on Germany. Then, changing his tactics, he said roughly, "'I suppose you realize that you are your sister's protector. In what sense?' "'If a man played about with my sister, I'd send a bullet through him. But perhaps you don't mind.' "'I mind very much,' protested Tibby. Who do you suspect, then? Speak out, man. One always suspects some one. No one. I don't think so. Involuntarily he blushed. He had remembered the scene in his Oxford rooms. You are hiding something, said Charles. As interviews go, he got the best of this one. When you saw her last, did she mention any one's name? Yes or no, he thundered, so that Tibby started. In my room she mentioned some friends called the Basts. Who are the Basts? People—friends of hers at Evie's wedding. I don't remember. But by great Scott, I do. My aunt told me about some tag-rag. Was she full of them when you saw her? Is there a man? Did she speak of the man? Or, look here, have you had any dealings with him? Tibby was silent. Without intending it, he had betrayed his sister's confidence. He was not enough interested in human life to see where things will lead to. He had a strong regard for honesty, and his word, once given, had always been kept up to now. He was deeply vexed, not only for the harm he had done Helen, but for the flaw he had discovered in his own equipment. "'I see. You are in his confidence. They met at your rooms. Oh, what a family! What a family!' God help the poor pater! 
and Tibby found himself alone. End of chapter 39 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 40 Leonard, he would figure at length in a newspaper report, but that evening he did not count for much. The foot of the tree was in shadow, since the moon was still hidden behind the house. But above, to right, to left, down the long meadow the moonlight was streaming. Leonard seemed not a man, but a cause. Perhaps it was Helen's way of falling in love, a curious way to Margaret, whose agony and whose contempt of Henry were yet imprinted with his image. Helen forgot people. They were husks that had enclosed her emotion. She could pity, or sacrifice herself, or have instincts, but had she ever loved in the noblest way, where man and woman, having lost themselves in sex, desire to lose sex itself in comradeship? Margaret wondered, but said no word of blame. This was Helen's evening. Troubles enough lay ahead of her, the loss of friends and of social advantages, the agony, the supreme agony of motherhood, which is even yet not a matter of common knowledge. For the present let the moon shine brightly, and the breezes of the spring blow gently, dying away from the gale of the day, and let the earth, who brings increase, bring peace. Not even to herself dare she blame Helen. She could not assess her trespass by any moral code. It was everything or nothing. Morality can tell us that murder is worse than stealing, and group most sins in an order all must approve, but it cannot group Helen. The surer its pronouncements on this point, the surer may we be that morality is not speaking. Christ was evasive when they questioned him. It is those that cannot connect who hasten to cast the first stone. This was Helen's evening, one at what cost and not to be marred by the sorrows of others. Of her own tragedy, Margaret never uttered a word. "'One isolates,' said Helen slowly. "'I isolated Mr. Wilcox from the other forces that were pulling Leonard downhill. Consequently I was full of pity, and almost of revenge. For weeks I had blamed Mr. Wilcox only. And so, when your letters came—' "'I need never have written them,' sighed Margaret. "'They never shielded Henry. How hopeless it is to tidy away the past, even for others!' I did not know that it was your own idea to dismiss the vasts. Looking back, that was wrong of me. Looking back, darling, I know that it was right. It is right to save the man whom one loves. I am less enthusiastic about justice now. But we both thought you wrote at his dictation. It seemed the last touch of his callousness. Being very much wrought up by this time, and Mrs. Bast was upstairs. I had not seen her, and had talked for a long time to Leonard. I had snubbed him for no reason, and that should have warned me I was in danger. So when the notes came, I wanted us to go to you for an explanation. He said that he guessed the explanation. He knew of it, and you mustn't know. I pressed him to tell me. He said no one must know. It was something to do with his wife. Right up to the end we were Mr. Bast and Miss Schlegel. I was going to tell him that he must be frank with me when I saw his eyes, and guessed that Mr. Wilcox had ruined him in two ways, not one. I drew him to me. I made him tell me. I felt very lonely myself. He is not to blame. He would have gone on worshipping me. I want never to see him again though it sounds appalling. I wanted to give him money, and feel finished. Oh, Meg, the little that is known about these things!" She laid her face against the tree. The little, too, that is known about growth! Both times it was loneliness, and the night, and panic afterwards. Did Leonard grow out of Paul? Margaret did not speak for a moment. So tired was she that her attention had actually wandered to the teeth, the teeth that had been thrust into the tree's bark to medicate it. From where she sat she could see them gleam. She had been trying to count them. 
"'Leonard is a better growth than madness,' she said. "'I was afraid that you would react against Paul until you went over the verge.' "'I did react until I found poor Leonard. I am steady now. I shan't ever like your Henry, dearest Meg, or even speak kindly about him. But all that blinding hate is over. I shall never rave against Wilcox's any more. I understand how you married him, and you will now be very happy." Margaret did not reply. "'Yes,' repeated Helen, her voice growing more tender. "'I do at last understand.' Except Mrs. Wilcox, dearest, no one understands our little movements. Because in death, I agree, not quite. I feel that you and I and Henry are only fragments of that woman's mind. She knows everything. She is everything. She is the house, and the tree that leans over it. People have their own deaths as well as their own lives, and even if there is nothing beyond death, we shall differ in our nothingness. I cannot believe that knowledge such as hers will perish with knowledge such as mine. She knew about realities. She knew when people were in love, though she was not in the room. I don't doubt that she knew when Henry deceived her. "'Good night, Mrs. Wilcox,' called a voice. "'Oh, good night, Miss Avery.' "'Why should Miss Avery work for us?' Helen murmured. Why, indeed?" Miss Avery crossed the lawn and merged into the hedge that divided it from the farm. An old gap, which Mr. Wilcox had filled up, had reappeared, and her track through the dew followed the path that he had turfed over, when he improved the garden and made it possible for games. "'This is not quite our house yet,' said Helen. "'When Miss Avery called, I felt we are only a couple of tourists.' We shall be that everywhere, and for ever. But affectionate tourists! But tourists who pretend each hotel is their home. I can't pretend very long, said Helen. Sitting under this tree one forgets, but I know that to-morrow I shall see the moon rise out of Germany. Not all your goodness can alter the facts of the case. Unless you will come with me. Margaret thought for a moment. In the past year she had grown so fond of England that to leave it was a real grief. Yet what detained her? No doubt Henry would pardon her outburst, and go on blustering and muddling into a ripe old age. But what was the good? She had just as soon vanish from his mind. "'Are you serious in asking me, Helen? Should I get on with your monica?' "'You would not.' but I am serious in asking you. Still no more plans now, and no more reminiscences. They were silent for a little. It was Helen's evening. The present flowed by them like a stream. The tree rustled. It had made music before they were born, and would continue after their deaths. But its song was of the moment. The moment had passed. The tree rustled again. Their senses were sharpened and they seemed to apprehend life. Life passed. The tree nestled again. "'Sleep now,' said Margaret. The peace of the country was entering into her. It has no commerce with memory, and little with hope. Least of all is it concerned with the hopes of the next five minutes. It is the peace of the present which passes understanding. Its murmur came, now— and now, once more, as they trod the gravel, and now, as the moonlight fell upon their father's sword, they passed upstairs, kissed, and amidst the endless iterations fell asleep. The house had enshadowed the tree at first, but as the moon rose higher the two disentangled, and were clear for a few moments at midnight. Margaret awoke and looked into the garden. How incomprehensible that Leonard Bast should have won her this night of peace! Was he also part of Mrs. Wilcox's mind? End of chapter 40 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 41 Far different was Leonard's development. 
the months after Oniton, whatever minor troubles they might bring him, were all overshadowed by remorse. When Helen looked back she could philosophize, or she could look into the future and plan for her child. But the father saw nothing beyond his own sin. Weeks afterwards, in the midst of other occupations, he would suddenly cry out, "'Brute! You brute! I couldn't have!' and be rent into two people who held dialogues. Or brown rain would descend, blotting out faces and the sky. Even Jackie noticed the change in him. Most terrible were his sufferings when he awoke from sleep. Sometimes he was happy at first, but grew conscious of a burden hanging to him, and weighing down his thoughts when they would move. Or little iron scorched his body, or a sword stabbed him. He would sit at the edge of his bed, holding his heart and moaning, "'Oh, what shall I do? Whatever shall I do?' Nothing brought ease. He could put distance between him and the trespass, but it grew in his soul. Remorse is not among the eternal verities. The Greeks were right to dethrone her. Her action is too capricious, as though the Aranyes selected for punishment only certain men and certain sins. And of all means to regeneration, remorse is surely the most wasteful. It cuts away healthy tissues with the poisoned. It is a knife that probes far deeper than the evil. Leonard was driven straight through its torments, and emerged pure but enfeebled. A better man, who would never lose control of himself again, but also a smaller, who had less to control. Nor did purity mean peace. The use of the knife can become a habit as hard to shake off as passion itself, and Leonard continued to start with a cry out of dreams. He built up a situation that was far enough from the truth. It never occurred to him that Helen was to blame. He forgot the intensity of their talk, the charm that had been lent him by sincerity, the magic of Oniton under darkness and of the whispering river. Helen loved the absolute. Leonard had been ruined absolutely and had appeared to her as a man apart, isolated from the world. A real man who cared for adventure and beauty, who desired to live decently and pay his way, who could have travelled more gloriously through life than the juggernaut car that was crushing him. Memories of Evie's wedding had warped her. The starched servants, the yards of uneaten food, the rustle of overdressed women, motor-cars oozing grease on the gravel, rubbish on a pretentious band. She had tasted the lees of this on her arrival. In the darkness, after failure, they intoxicated her. She and the victim seemed alone in a world of unreality, and she loved him absolutely, perhaps for half an hour. In the morning she was gone. The note that she left, tender and hysterical in tone, and intended to be most kind, hurt her lover terribly. It was as if some work of art had been broken by him, some picture in the National Gallery slashed out of its frame. When he recalled her talents and her social position, he felt that the first passer-by had a right to shoot him down. He was afraid of the waitress and the porters at the railway station. He was afraid at first of his wife, though later he was to regard her with a strange new tenderness and to think, there is nothing to choose between us, after all. The expedition to Shropshire crippled the Basts permanently. Helen, in her flight, forgot to settle the hotel bill, and took their return tickets away with her. They had to pawn Jackie's bangles to get home, and the smash came a few days afterwards. It is true that Helen offered him five thousand pounds, but such a sum meant nothing to him. He could not see that the girl was desperately writing herself, and trying to save something out of the disaster, if it was only five thousand pounds. But he had to live somehow. He turned to his family— and degraded himself to a professional beggar. There was nothing else for him to do. "'A letter from Leonard,' thought Blanche, his sister. "'And after all this time—' She hid it, so that her husband should not see, and when he had gone to his work read it with some emotion, and sent the prodigal a little money out of her dress allowance. "'A letter from Leonard,' said the other sister, Laura, a few days later. She showed it to her husband— he wrote a cruel, insolent reply, but sent more money than Blanche, so Leonard soon wrote to him again. And during the winter the system was developed. 
Leonard realized that they need never starve, because it would be too painful for his relatives. Society is based on the family, and the clever wastrel can exploit this indefinitely. Without a generous thought on either side, pounds and pounds passed. The donors disliked Leonard, and he grew to hate them intensely. When Laura censured his immoral marriage, he thought bitterly, "'She minds that. What would she say if she knew the truth?' When Blanche's husband offered him work, he found some pretext for avoiding it. He had wanted work keenly at Oniton, but too much anxiety had shattered him. He was joining the unemployable. When his brother, the lay-reader, did not reply to a letter, he wrote again, saying that he and Jackie would come down to his village on foot. He did not intend this as blackmail. Still, the brother sent a postal order, and it became part of the system. And so passed his winter and his spring. In the horror there are two bright spots. He never confused the past. He remained alive, and blessed are those who live, if it is only to a sense of sinfulness. The anodyne of muddledom, by which most men blur and blend their mistakes, never passed Leonard's lips. And if I drink oblivion of a day, so shorten I the stature of my soul. It is a hard saying, and a hard man wrote it, but it lies at the foot of all character. And the other bright spot was his tenderness for Jackie. He pitied her with nobility now, not the contemptuous pity of a man who sticks to a woman through thick and thin. He tried to be less irritable. He wondered what her hungry eyes desired, nothing that she could express, or that he or any man could give her. Would she ever receive the justice that is mercy? the justice for by-products that the world is too busy to bestow. She was fond of flowers, generous with money, and not revengeful. If she had borne him a child, he might have cared for her. Unmarried, Leonard would never have begged. He would have flickered out and died. But the whole of life is mixed. He had to provide for Jackie, and went down dirty paths that she might have a few feathers and dishes of food that suited her. One day he caught sight of Margaret and her brother. He was in St. Paul's. He had entered the cathedral partly to avoid the rain, and partly to see a picture that had educated him in former years. But the light was bad, the picture ill-placed, and time and judgment were inside him now. Death alone still charmed him, with her lap of poppies, on which all men shall sleep. He took one glance, and turned aimlessly away towards a chair. Then, down the nave, he saw Miss Schlegel and her brother. They stood in the fairway of passengers, and their faces were extremely grave. He was perfectly certain that they were in trouble about their sister. Once outside, and he fled immediately, he wished that he had spoken to them. What was his life? What were a few angry words, or even imprisonment? He had done wrong. That was the true terror. Whatever they might know, he would tell them everything he knew. He re-entered St. Paul's, but they had moved in his absence, and had gone to lay their difficulties before Mr. Wilcox and Charles. The sight of Margaret turned remorse into new channels. He desired to confess, and though the desire is proof of a weakened nature, which is about to lose the essence of human intercourse, it did not take an ignoble form. He did not suppose that confession would bring him happiness. It was rather that he yearned to get clear of the tangle. So does the suicide yearn. The impulses are akin, and the crime of suicide lies rather in its disregard for the feelings of those whom we leave behind. Confession need harm no one, it can satisfy that test, and though it was un-English, and ignored by our Anglican cathedral, Leonard had a right to decide upon it. Moreover, he trusted Margaret. He wanted her hardness now. That cold, intellectual nature of hers would be just, if unkind. He would do whatever she told him even if he had to see Helen. That was the supreme punishment she would exact. And perhaps she would tell him how Helen was. That was the supreme reward. He knew nothing about Margaret, not even whether she was married to Mr. Wilcox, and tracking her out took several days. That evening he toiled through the wet to Wickham Place, where the new flats were now appearing. Was he also the cause of their move? Were they expelled from society on his account? thence to a public library, but could find no satisfactory Schlegel in the directory. On the morrow he searched again. 
He hung about outside Mr. Wilcox's office at lunchtime, and as the clerks came out, said, "'Excuse me, sir, but is your boss married?' Most of them stared. Some said, "'What's that to you?' But one, who had not yet acquired reticence, told him what he wished. Leonard could not learn the private address. That necessitated more trouble with directories and tubes. Ducie Street was not discovered till the Monday, the day that Margaret and her husband went down on their hunting expedition to Howard's End. He called at about four o'clock. The weather had changed, and the sun shone gaily on the ornamental steps, black and white marble in triangles. Leonard lowered his eyes to them after ringing the bell. He felt in curious health. Doors seemed to be opening and shutting inside his body, and he had been obliged to sleep sitting up in bed, with his back propped against the wall. When the parlour-maid came, he could not see her face. The brown rain had descended suddenly. "'Does Mrs. Wilcox live here?' he asked. "'She's out,' was the answer. "'When will she be back?' "'I'll ask,' said the parlour-maid. Margaret had given instructions that no one who mentioned her name should ever be rebuffed. Putting the door on the chain, for Leonard's appearance demanded this, she went through to the smoking-room, which was occupied by Tibby. Tibby was asleep. He had had a good lunch. Charles Wilcox had not yet rung him up for the distracting interview. He said drowsily, "'I don't know. Hilton. Howard's End. Who is it?' "'I'll ask, sir.' "'No, don't bother.' "'They have taken the car to Howard's End,' said the parlour-maid to Leonard. He thanked her, and asked whereabouts that place was. "'You appear to want to know a good deal,' she remarked. But Margaret had forbidden her to be mysterious. She told him against her better judgment that Howard's End was in Hertfordshire. "'Is it a village, please?' "'Village! It's Mr. Wilcox's private house. At least it's one of them. Mrs. Wilcox keeps a furniture there. Hilton is the village.' "'Yes. And when will they be back?' "'Mr. Schlegel doesn't know. We can't know everything, can we?' She shut him out, and went to attend to the telephone, which was ringing furiously. He loitered away another night of agony. Confession grew more difficult. As soon as possible he went to bed. He watched a patch of moonlight cross the floor of their lodging, and, as sometimes happens when the mind is overtaxed, he fell asleep for the rest of the room, but kept awake for the patch of moonlight. Horrible! Then began one of those disintegrating dialogues. Part of him said— why horrible? It's ordinary light from the room. But it moves. So does the moon. But it is a clenched fist. Why not? But it is going to touch me. Let it! And seeming to gather motion, the patch ran up his blanket. Presently a blue snake appeared, then another parallel to it. Is there life in the moon? Of course. But I thought it was uninhabited. Not by time, death, judgment, and the smaller snakes. "'Smaller snakes?' said Leonard indignantly, and aloud. "'What a notion!' By a rending effort of the will, he woke the rest of the room up. Jackie, the bed, their food, their clothes on the chair, gradually entered his consciousness, and the horror vanished outwards, like a ring that is spreading through water. "'I say, Jackie, I'm going out for a bit.' She was breathing regularly. The patch of light fell clear of the striped blanket, and began to cover the shawl that lay over her feet. Why had he been afraid? He went to the window, and saw that the moon was descending through a clear sky. He saw her volcanoes, and the bright expanses that a gracious error has named seas. They paled, for the sun, who had lit them up, was coming to light the earth. Sea of serenity, sea of tranquillity— ocean of the lunar storms, merged into one lucent drop, itself to slip into the sempiternal dawn. And he had been afraid of the moon. He dressed among the contending lights, and went through his money. It was running low again, but enough for a return ticket to Hilton. As it clinked, Jackie opened her eyes. "'Hello, Len. What ho, Len. What ho, Jackie. See you again later.' She turned over and slept. The house was unlocked, their landlord being a salesman at Covent Garden. Leonard passed out and made his way down to the station. The train, though it did not start for an hour, 
was already drawn up at the end of the platform, and he lay down in it and slept. With the first jolt he was in daylight. They had left the gateways of King's Cross and were under blue sky. Tunnels followed, and after each the sky grew bluer, and from the embankment at Finsbury Park he had his first sight of the sun. It rolled along behind the eastern smokes, a wheel, whose fellow was the descending moon, and as yet it seemed the servant of the blue sky, not its lord. He dozed again. Over two in water it was day. To the left fell the shadow of the embankment and its arches. To the right Leonard saw up into the two in woods and towards the church, with its wild legend of immortality. Six forest trees, that is a fact, grow out of one of the graves in two in churchyard. The grave's occupant, that is the legend, is an atheist, who declared that if God existed, six forest trees would grow out of her grave. These things in Hertfordshire, and farther afield lay the house of a hermit, Mrs. Wilcox had known him, who barred himself up, and wrote prophecies, and gave all he had to the poor. While, powdered in between, were the villas of business men, who saw life more steadily, though with the steadiness of the half-closed eye. Over all the sun was streaming, to all the birds were singing, to all the primroses were yellow and the speedwell blue, and the country, however they interpreted her, was uttering her cry of, Now! She did not free Leonard yet, and the knife plunged deeper into his heart as the train drew up at Hilton. But remorse had become beautiful. Hilton was asleep, or at the earliest, breakfasting. Leonard noticed the contrast when he stepped out of it into the country. Here men had been up since dawn. Their hours were ruled not by a London office, but by the movements of the crops and the sun. That they were men of the finest type only the sentimentalist can declare. But they kept to the life of daylight. They are England's hope. Clumsily they carry forward the torch of the sun, until such time as the nation sees fit to take it up. Half clodhopper, half school-board prig, they can still throw back to a nobler stock, and breed yeomen. At the chalk-pit a motor passed him. In it was another type, whom nature favours, the imperial. Healthy, ever in motion, it hopes to inherit the earth. It breeds as quickly as the yeoman, and as soundly. Strong is the temptation to acclaim it as a super-yeoman, who carries his country's virtue overseas. But the imperialist is not what he thinks or seems. He is a destroyer. He prepares the way for cosmopolitanism, and though his ambitions may be fulfilled, the earth that he inherits will be grey. To Leonard, intent on his private sin, there came the conviction of innate goodness elsewhere. It was not the optimism which he had been taught at school. Again and again must the drums tap, and the goblins stalk over the universe, before joy can be purged of the superficial. It was rather paradoxical, and arose from his sorrow. Death destroys a man, but the idea of death saves him. That is the best account of it that has yet been given. Squalor and tragedy can beckon to all that is great in us, and strengthen the wings of love. They can beckon, it is not certain that they will, for they are not love's servants. But they can beckon, and the knowledge of this incredible truth comforted him. As he approached the house all thought stopped. Contradictory notions stood side by side in his mind. He was terrified, but happy, ashamed, but had done no sin. He knew the confession. Mrs. Wilcox, I have done wrong. But sunrise had robbed its meaning, and he felt rather on a supreme adventure. He entered a garden, steadied himself against a motor-car that he found in it, found a door open and entered a house. Yes, it would be very easy. From a room to the left he heard voices, Margaret's amongst them. His own name was called aloud, and a man whom he had never seen said, "'Oh, is he there? I am not surprised. I now thrash him within an inch of his life.' "'Mrs. Wilcox,' said Leonard, "'I have done wrong.' The man took him by the collar and cried, "'Bring me a stick!' Women were screaming. A stick, very bright, descended. It hurt him, not where it descended, but in the heart. Books fell over him in a shower. Nothing had sense. "'Get some water,' commanded Charles. 
who had all through kept very calm. "'He's shamming. Of course I only use the blade. Here, carry him out into the air.' Thinking that he understood these things, Margaret obeyed him. They laid Leonard, who was dead, on the gravel. Helen poured water over him. "'That's enough,' said Charles. "'Yes, murder's enough,' said Miss Avery, coming out of the house with the sword." End of chapter 41 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 42 When Charles left Ducie Street, he had caught the first train home, but had no inkling of the newest development until late at night. Then his father, who had dined alone, sent for him, and in very grave tones inquired for Margaret. "'I don't know where she is, Peter,' said Charles. "'Dolly kept back dinner nearly an hour for her.' "'Tell me when she comes in.' Another hour passed. The servants went to bed, and Charles visited his father again, to receive further instructions. Mrs. Wilcox had still not returned. "'I'll set up for her as late as you like, but she can hardly be coming. Isn't she stopping with her sister at the hotel?' "'Perhaps,' said Mr. Wilcox thoughtfully. "'Perhaps.' "'Can I do anything for you, sir?' "'Not to-night, my boy.' Mr. Wilcox liked being called sir. He raised his eyes and gave his son more open a look of tenderness than he usually ventured. He saw Charles as little boy and strong man in one. Though his wife had proved unstable, his children were left to him. After midnight he tapped on Charles's door. "'I can't sleep,' he said. "'I had better have a talk with you and get it over.' He complained of the heat. Charles took him out into the garden, and they paced up and down in their dressing-gowns. Charles became very quiet as the story unrolled. He had known all along that Margaret was as bad as her sister. "'She will feel differently in the morning,' said Mr. Wilcox, who had of course said nothing about Mrs. Bast. "'But I cannot let this kind of thing continue without comment. I am morally certain that she is with her sister at Howard's End. The house is mine.' And, Charles, it will be yours. And when I say that no one is to live there, I mean that no one is to live there. I won't have it." He looked angrily at the moon. "'To my mind, this question is connected with something far greater—the rights of property itself.' "'Undoubtedly,' said Charles. Mr. Wilcox linked his arm in his son's, but somehow liked him less as he told him more. "'I don't want you to conclude that my wife and I had anything of the nature of a quarrel. She was only overwrought, as who would not be. I shall do all that I can for Helen, but on the understanding that they clear out of the house at once. Do you see? That is a sine qua non. Then at eight to-morrow I may go up in the car. Eight or earlier. Say that you are acting as my representative, and of course use no violence, Charles. On the morrow, as Charles returned, leaving Leonard dead upon the gravel, it did not seem to him that he had used violence. Death was due to heart disease. His stepmother herself had said so, and even Miss Avery had acknowledged that he had only used the flat of the sword. On his way through the village he informed the police, who thanked him, and said there must be an inquest. He found his father in the garden shading his eyes from the sun. "'It has been pretty horrible,' said Charles gravely. "'They were there, and they had the man up there with them, too.' "'What?' What man? I told you last night. His name was Bast. My God! Is it possible? said Mr. Wilcox. In your mother's house? Charles, in your mother's house? I know, Peter. That was what I felt. As a matter of fact, there is no need to trouble about the man. He was in the last stages of heart disease, and just before I could show him what I thought of him, he went off. The police are seeing about it at this moment. Mr. Wilcox listened attentively. "'I got up there—oh, it couldn't have been more than half-past seven. The Avery woman's lighting a fire for them. They were still upstairs. I waited in the drawing-room. We were all moderately civil and collected, though I had my suspicions. I gave them your message, and Mrs. Wilcox said, "'Oh, yes, I see, yes,' in that way of hers. "'Nothing else. I promised to tell you, with her love—' that she was going to Germany with her sister this evening. 
That was all we had time for. Mr. Wilcox seemed relieved. Because by then I suppose the man got tired of hiding, for suddenly Mrs. Wilcox screamed out his name. I recognized it, and I went for him in the hall. Was I right, Pater? I thought things were going a little too far. Right, my dear boy. I don't know. But he would have been no son of mine if you hadn't. Then he did just—just just crumple up, as you said. He shrunk from the simple word. He caught hold of the bookcase, which came down over him. So I merely put the sword down and carried him into the garden. We all thought he was shamming. However, he's dead right enough. Awful business. Sword? cried his father, with anxiety in his voice. What sword? Whose sword? A sword of theirs. What were you doing with it? Well, didn't you see, Pater, I had to snatch up the first thing handy. I hadn't a riding whip or stick. I caught him once or twice over the shoulders with the flat of their old German sword. Then what? He pulled over the bookcase, as I said, and fell, said Charles, with a sigh. It was no fun doing errands for his father, who was never quite satisfied. But the real cause was heart disease. Of that you're sure? That or fit. However, we shall hear more than enough at the inquest on such unsavoury topics. They went into breakfast. Charles had a racking headache, consequent on motoring before food. He was also anxious about the future, reflecting that the police must detain Helen and Margaret for the inquest, and ferret the whole thing out. He saw himself obliged to leave Hilton. One could not afford to live near the scene of a scandal. It was not fair on one's wife. His comfort was that the pater's eyes were opened at last. There would be a horrible smash-up, and probably a separation from Margaret. Then they would all start again, more as they had been in his mother's time. "'I think I'll go round to the police station,' said his father, when breakfast was over. "'What for?' cried Dolly, who had still not been told. "'Very well, sir. Which car will you have?' "'I think I'll walk.' "'It's a good half-mile.' said Charles, stepping into the garden. The sun's very hot for April. Shan't I take you up, and then perhaps a little spin round by Tewin? You go on as if I didn't know my own mind, said Mr. Wilcox, fretfully. Charles hardened his mouth. You young fellows want ideas to get into a motor. I tell you, I want to walk. I'm very fond of walking. Oh, all right. I'm about the house if you want me for anything. I thought of not going up to the office to-day, if that is your wish." "'It is indeed, my boy,' said Mr. Wilcox, and laid a hand on his sleeve. Charles did not like it. He was uneasy about his father, who did not seem himself this morning. There was a petulant touch about him, more like a woman. Could it be that he was growing old? The Wilcoxes were not lacking in affection. They had it royally, but they did not know how to use it. It was the talent in the napkin, and for a warm-hearted man, Charles had conveyed very little joy. As he watched his father shuffling up the road, he had a vague regret, a wish that something had been different somewhere, a wish, though he did not express it thus, that he had been taught to say I in his youth. He meant to make up for Margaret's defection, but knew that his father had been very happy with her until yesterday. How had she done it? by some dishonest trick, no doubt. But how? Mr. Wilcox reappeared at eleven, looking very tired. There was to be an inquest on Leonard's body to-morrow, and the police required his son to attend. "'I expected that,' said Charles. "'I shall naturally be the most important witness there.'" End of chapter 42 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster. Chapter 43. Out of the turmoil and horror that had begun with Aunt Julie's illness, and was not even to end with Leonard's death, it seemed impossible to Margaret that healthy life should re-emerge. Events succeeded in a logical, yet senseless train. People lost their humanity, and took values as arbitrary as those in a pack of playing cards. It was natural that Henry should do this, and cause Helen to do that, and then think her wrong for doing it. Natural that she herself should think him wrong. Natural that Leonard should want to know how Helen was, and come, and Charles be angry with him for coming. Natural, 
but unreal. In this jangle of causes and effects, what had become of their true selves? Here Leonard lay dead in the garden, from natural causes. Yet life was a deep, deep river, death a blue sky. Life was a house, death a wisp of hay, a flower, a tower. Life and death were anything and everything, except this ordered insanity, where the king takes the queen, and the ace the king. Ah, no! There was beauty and adventure behind, such as the man at her feet had yearned for. There was hope this side of the grave. There were truer relationships beyond the limits that fetter us now. As a prisoner looks up and sees stars beckoning, so she, from the turmoil and horror of those days, caught glimpses of the diviner wheels. And Helen, dumb with fright, but trying to keep calm for the child's sake, and Miss Avery, calm, but murmuring tenderly, No one ever told the lad I'll have a child. They also reminded her that horror is not the end. To what ultimate harmony we tend she did not know. But there seemed great chance that a child would be born into the world, to take the great chances of beauty and adventure that the world offers. She moved through the sunlit garden, gathering narcissi, crimson-eyed and white. There was nothing else to be done. The time for telegrams and anger was over, and it seemed wisest that the hands of Leonard should be folded on his breast, and be filled with flowers. Here was the father. Leave it at that. Let squalor be turned into tragedy, whose eyes are the stars, and whose hands hold the sunset and the dawn. And even the influx of officials, even the return of the doctor, vulgar and acute, could not shake her belief in the eternity of beauty. Science explained people, but could not understand them. After long centuries among the bones and muscles, it might be advancing to knowledge of the nerves, but this would never give understanding. One could open the heart to Mr. Mansbridge and his sort without discovering its secrets to them, for they wanted everything down in black and white, and black and white was exactly what they were left with. They questioned her closely about Charles. She never suspected why. Death had come, and the doctor agreed that it was due to heart disease. They asked to see her father's sword. She explained that Charles's anger was natural, but mistaken. Miserable questions about Leonard followed all of which she answered unfalteringly. Then back to Charles again. "'No doubt Mr. Wilcox may have induced death,' she said. "'But if it wasn't one thing, it would have been another, as you yourselves know.' At last they thanked her, and took the sword and the body down to Hilton. She began to pick up the books from the floor. Helen had gone to the farm. It was the best place for her, since she had to wait for the inquest. Though, as if things were not hard enough, Madge and her husband had raised trouble. They did not see why they should receive the off-scourings of Howard's End. And, of course, they were right. The whole world was going to be right, and simply avenge any brave talk against the conventions. "'Nothing matters,' the Schlegels had said in the past, "'except one's self-respect and that of one's friends.' When the time came, other things mattered terribly. However, Madge had yielded, and Helen was assured of peace for one day and night, and to-morrow she would return to Germany. As for herself, she determined to go too. No message came from Henry. Perhaps he expected her to apologize. Now that she had time to think over her own tragedy, she was unrepentant. She neither forgave him for his behaviour, nor wished to forgive him. Her speech to him seemed perfect. She would not have altered a word. It had to be uttered once in a life, to adjust the lopsidedness of the world. It was spoken not only to her husband, but to thousands of men like him, a protest against the inner darkness in high places that comes with a commercial age. Though he would build up his life without hers, she could not apologize. He had refused to connect, on the clearest issue that can be laid before a man, and their love must take the consequences. No, there was nothing more to be done. They had tried not to go over the precipice, but perhaps the fall was inevitable. And it comforted her to think that the future was certainly inevitable. Cause and effect would go jangling forward to some goal, doubtless, but to none that she could imagine. At such moments the soul retires within, to float upon the bosom of a deeper stream, and has communion with the dead, 
and sees the world's glory not diminished, but different in kind to what she has supposed. She alters her focus until trivial things are blurred. Margaret had been tending this way all the winter. Leonard's death brought her to the goal. Alas, that Henry should fade away, as reality emerged, and only her love for him should remain clear, stamped with his image like the cameos we rescue out of dreams. With unfaltering eye she traced his future. He would soon present a healthy mind to the world again, and what did he or the world care if he was rotten at the core? He would grow into a rich, jolly old man, at times a little sentimental about women, but emptying his glass with any one. Tenacious of power, he would keep Charles and the rest dependent, and retire from business reluctantly and at an advanced age. He would settle down, though she could not realize this. In her eyes Henry was always moving, and causing others to move, until the ends of the earth met. But in time he must get too tired to move, and settle down. What next? The inevitable word. The release of the soul to its appropriate heaven. Would they meet in it? Margaret believed in immortality for herself. An eternal future had always seemed natural to her. And Henry believed in it for himself. Yet would they meet again? Are there not rather endless levels beyond the grave, as the theory that he had censured teaches? And his level, whether higher or lower, could it possibly be the same as hers? Thus gravely meditating, she was summoned by him. He sent up Crane in the motor. Other servants passed like water, but the chauffeur remained, though impertinent and disloyal. Margaret disliked Crane, and he knew it. "'Is it the keys that Mr. Wilcox wants?' she asked. "'He didn't say, madam.' "'You haven't any note for me?' "'He didn't say, madam.' After a moment's thought she locked up Howard's end. It was pitiable to see in it the stirrings of warmth that would be quenched for ever. She raked out the fire that was blazing in the kitchen, and spread the coals in the graveled yard. She closed the windows and drew the curtains. Henry would probably sell the place now. She was determined not to spare him, for nothing new had happened as far as they were concerned. Her mood might never have altered from yesterday evening. He was standing a little outside Charles's gate, and motioned the car to stop. When his wife got out, he said hoarsely, "'I prefer to discuss things with you outside.' "'It will be more appropriate in the road, I am afraid,' said Margaret. "'Did you get my message?' "'What about?' "'I am going to Germany with my sister. I must tell you now that I shall make it my permanent home. Our talk last night was more important than you have realised.' I am unable to forgive you, and am leaving you. "'I am extremely tired,' said Henry, in injured tones. "'I have been walking about all the morning, and wish to sit down.' "'Certainly, if you will consent to sit on the grass. The great north road should have been bordered all its length with glebe. Henry's kind had filched most of it. She moved to the scrap opposite, wherein were the six hills. They sat down on the farther side— so that they could not be seen by Charles or Dolly. "'Here are your keys,' said Margaret. She tossed them towards him. They fell on the sunlit slope of grass, and he did not pick them up. "'I have something to tell you,' he said gently. She knew this superficial gentleness, this confession of hastiness, that was only intended to enhance her admiration of the male. "'I don't want to hear it,' she replied. "'My sister is going to be ill.' My life is going to be with her now. We must manage to build up something, she and I and her child. Where are you going? Munich. We start after the inquest, if she is not too ill. After the inquest? Yes. Have you realized what the verdict at the inquest will be? Yes. Heart disease. No, my dear. Manslaughter. Margaret drove her fingers through the grass. The hill beneath her moved as if it was alive. Manslaughter, repeated Mr. Wilcox. Charles may go to prison. I dare not tell him. I don't know what to do. What to do. I'm broken. I'm ended. No sudden warmth arose in her. She did not see that to break him was her only hope. 
she did not enfold the sufferer in her arms. But all through that day and the next, a new life began to move. The verdict was brought in. Charles was committed for trial. It was against all reason that he should be punished, but the law, being made in his image, sentenced him to three years' imprisonment. Then Henry's fortress gave way. He could bear no one but his wife. He shambled up to Margaret afterwards, and asked her to do what she could with him. She did what seemed easiest— she took him down to recruit at Howard's End. End of chapter 43 Recording by Elizabeth Clett Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 44 Tom's father was cutting the big meadow. He passed again and again amid whirring blades and sweet odors of grass, encompassing with narrowing circles the sacred center of the field. Tom was negotiating with Helen. "'I haven't any idea,' she replied. "'Do you suppose Baby may, Meg?' Margaret put down her work and regarded them absently. "'What was that?' she asked. "'Tom wants to know whether Baby is old enough to play with hay.' "'I haven't the least notion,' answered Margaret, and took up her work again. "'Now, Tom, Baby is not to stand. He is not to lie on his face.' He is not to lie so that his head wags. He is not to be teased or tickled. And he is not to be cut into two or more pieces by the cutter. Will you be as careful as all that?" Tom held out his arms. "'That child is a wonderful nursemaid,' remarked Margaret. "'He is fond of baby. That's why he does it,' was Helen's answer. "'They're going to be lifelong friends.' "'Starting at the ages of six and one. "'Of course. "'It will be a great thing for Tom. "'It may be a greater thing for Baby.' Fourteen months had passed, "'but Margaret still stopped at Howard's End. "'No better plan had occurred to her. "'The meadow was being recut. "'The great red poppies were reopening in the garden. "'July would follow with the little red poppies among the wheat, "'August with the cutting of the wheat.' These little events would become part of her, year after year. Every summer she would fear lest the well should give out, every winter lest the pipes should freeze, every westerly gale might blow the witch-elm down and bring the end of all things, and so she could not read or talk during a westerly gale. The air was tranquil now. She and her sister were sitting on the remains of Evie's rockery, where the lawn merged into the field. "'What a time they all are!' said Helen. What can they be doing inside?" Margaret, who was growing less talkative, made no answer. The noise of the cutter came intermittently, like the breaking of waves. Close by them a man was preparing to scythe out one of the dell-holes. "'I wish Henry was out to enjoy this,' said Helen. "'This lovely weather, and to be shut up in the house. It's very hard.' "'It has to be,' said Margaret. The hay fever is his chief objection against living here, but he thinks it worth while. Meg, is or isn't he ill? I can't make out. Not ill. Eternally tired. He has worked very hard all his life, and noticed nothing. Those are the people who collapse when they do notice a thing. I suppose he worries dreadfully about his part of the tangle. Dreadfully. That is why I wish Dolly had not come too to-day. Still, he wanted them all to come. It has to be. Why does he want them? Margaret did not answer. Meg, may I tell you something? I like Henry. You'd be odd if you didn't, said Margaret. I usent to. Usent? She lowered her eyes a moment to the black abyss of the past. They had crossed it, always excepting Leonard and Charles. They were building up a new life, obscure, yet gilded with tranquillity. Leonard was dead. Charles had two more years in prison. One usent always to see clearly before that time. It was different now. I like Henry, because he does worry. And he likes you, because you don't. Helen sighed. She seemed humiliated, and buried her face in her hands. After a time she said, 
above love, a transition less abrupt than it appeared. Margaret never stopped working. I mean, a woman's love for a man. I supposed I should hang my life on to that once, and was driven up and down and about as if something was worrying through me. But everything is peaceful now. I seem cured. That Herr Forstmeister, whom Frieda keeps writing about, must be a noble character, but he doesn't see that I shall never marry him or any one. It isn't shame or mistrust of myself. I simply couldn't. I'm ended. I used to be so dreamy about a man's love as a girl, and think that for good or evil love must be the great thing. But it hasn't been. It has been itself a dream. Do you agree? I do not agree. I do not. I ought to remember Leonard as my lover," said Helen, stepping down into the field. I tempted him, and killed him, and it is surely the least I can do. I would like to throw out all my heart to Leonard on such an afternoon as this. But I cannot. It is no good pretending. I am forgetting him." Her eyes filled with tears. How nothing seems to match! How my darling, my precious! She broke off. Tommy! Yes, please! Baby's not to try and stand. There's something wanting in me. I see you loving Henry, and understanding him better daily, and I know that death wouldn't part you in the least. But I— Is it some awful, appalling criminal defect? Margaret silenced her. She said, It is only that people are far more different than is pretended. All over the world men and women are worrying because they cannot develop as they are supposed to develop. Here and there they have the matter out and it comforts them. Don't fret yourself, Helen. Develop what you have. Love your child. I do not love children. I am thankful to have none. I can play with their beauty and charm. But that is all. Nothing real. Not one scrap of what there ought to be. And others. Others go farther still, and move outside humanity altogether. A place, as well as a person, may catch the glow. Don't you see that all this leads to comfort in the end? It is part of the battle against sameness. Differences, eternal differences, planted by God in a single family, so that there may always be colour. Sorrow, perhaps, but colour in the daily grey. Then I can't have you worrying about Leonard. Don't drag in the personal when it will not come. Forget him. Yes. Yes, but what has Leonard got out of life? Perhaps an adventure. Is that enough? Not for us, but for him. Helen took up a bunch of grass. She looked at the sorrel, and the red and white and yellow clover, and the Quaker grass, and the daisies, and the bents that composed it. She raised it to her face. Is it sweetening yet? asked Margaret. No, only withered. It will sweeten to-morrow. Helen smiled. Oh, Meg, you are a person, she said. Think of the racket and torture this time last year. But now I couldn't stop unhappy if I tried. What a change! And all through you. Oh, we merely settled down. You and Henry learnt to understand one another and to forgive, all through the autumn and the winter. Yes, but who settled us down? Margaret did not reply. The scything had begun, and she took off her pince-nez to watch it. You! cried Helen. You did it all, sweetest, though you're too stupid to see. Living here was your plan. I wanted you, he wanted you, and every one said it was impossible, but you knew. Just think of our lives without you, Meg. I and Baby with Monica, revolting by theory. He handed about from Dolly to Evie. But you picked up the pieces, and made us a home. Can't it strike you, even for a moment, that your life has been heroic? Can't you remember the two months after Charles's arrest, when you began to act, and did all? 
"'You were both ill at the time,' said Margaret. "'I did the obvious things. I had two invalids to nurse. Here was a house, ready furnished and empty. It was obvious. I didn't know myself it would turn into a permanent home. No doubt I have done a little towards straightening the tangle, but things that I can't phrase have helped me.' "'I hope it will be permanent,' said Helen, drifting away to other thoughts. "'I think so. There are moments when I feel Howard's end peculiarly our own. All the same, London's creeping.' She pointed over the meadow, over eight or nine meadows, but at the end of them was a red rust. "'You see that in Surrey, and even Hampshire now,' she continued. "'I can see it from the Purbeck Downs. And London is only part of something else, I'm afraid. Life's going to be melted down, all over the world." Margaret knew that her sister spoke truly. Howard's End, Oniton, the Purbeck Downs, the Oderberge, were all survivals, and the melting pot was being prepared for them. Logically, they had no right to be alive. One's hope was in the weakness of logic. Were they possibly the earth beating time? "'Because a thing is going strong now, it need not go strong for ever,' she said. "'This craze for motion is only set in during the last hundred years. It may be followed by a civilization that won't be a movement, because it will rest on the earth. All the signs are against it now. But I can't help hoping. And very early in the morning in the garden, I feel that our house is the future, as well as the past.' They turned and looked at it. Their own memories coloured it now, for Helen's child had been born in the central room of the Nine. Then Margaret said, "'Oh, take care!' for something moved behind the window of the hall, and the door opened. "'The conclave's breaking at last. I'll go.' It was Paul. Helen retreated with the children far into the field. Friendly voices greeted her. Margaret rose to encounter a man with a heavy black moustache. "'My father is asked for you,' he said, with hostility. She took her work and followed him. "'We have been talking business,' he continued. "'But I dare say you knew all about it beforehand.' "'Yes, I did.' Clumsy of movement, for he had spent all his life in the saddle, Paul drove his foot against the paint of the front door. Mrs. Wilcox gave a little cry of annoyance. She did not like anything scratched. She stopped in the hall to take Dolly's boa and gloves out of a vase. Her husband was lying in a great leather armchair in the dining-room, and by his side, holding his hand rather ostentatiously, was Evie. Dolly, dressed in purple, sat near the window. The room was a little dark and airless. They were obliged to keep it like this until the carting of the hay. Margaret joined the family without speaking. The five of them had met already at tea and she knew quite well what was going to be said. Averse to wasting her time, she went on sewing. The clock struck six. "'Is this going to suit every one?' said Henry, in a weary voice. He used the old phrases, but their effect was unexpected and shadowy. "'Because I don't want you all coming here later on and complaining that I have been unfair.' "'It's apparently got to suit us,' said Paul. "'I beg your pardon, my boy.' You have only to speak, and I will leave the house to you instead." Paul frowned ill-temperedly, and began scratching at his arm. "'As I have given up the outdoor life that suited me, and I have come home to look after the business, it's no good my settling down here,' he said at last. "'It's not really the country, and it's not the town.' "'Very well. Does my arrangement suit you, Evie?' "'Of course, father.' "'And you, Dolly?' Dolly raised her faded little face, which sorrow could wither but not steady. "'Perfectly splendidly,' she said. "'I thought Charles wanted it for the boys, but last time I saw him he said no, because we cannot possibly live in this part of England again. Charles says we ought to change our name, but I cannot think what to, for Wilcox just suits Charles and me, and I can't think of any other name.' There was a general silence. Dolly looked nervously round, fearing that she had been inappropriate. Paul continued to scratch his arm. "'Then I leave Howard's End to my wife, absolutely,' said Henry. "'And let every one understand that. 
and after I am dead, let there be no jealousy and no surprise. Margaret did not answer. There was something uncanny in her triumph. She, who had never expected to conquer any one, had charged straight through these Wilcoxes and broken up their lives. "'In consequence, I leave my wife no money,' said Henry. "'That is her own wish. All that she would have had will be divided among you. I am also giving you a great deal in my lifetime, so that you may be independent of me. That is her wish, too. She also is giving away a great deal of money. She intends to diminish her income by half during the next ten years. She intends, when she dies, to leave the house to her—to her nephew, down in the field. Is that all clear? Does every one understand?" Paul rose to his feet. He was accustomed to natives, and very little shook him out of the Englishman. Feeling manly and cynical, he said, "'Down in the field? Oh, come! I think we might have had the whole establishment, Piccaninnies included.' Mrs. Carhill whispered, "'Don't, Paul. You promised you'd take care.' Feeling a woman of the world, she rose and prepared to take her leave. Her father kissed her. "'Good-bye, old girl,' he said. "'Don't you worry about me.' "'Good-bye, Dad.' Then it was Dolly's turn. Anxious to contribute, she laughed nervously and said, "'Good-bye, Mr. Wilcox. It does seem curious that Mrs. Wilcox should have left Margaret Howard's end, and yet she gets it after all.' From Evie came a sharply drawn breath. "'Good-bye,' she said to Margaret, and kissed her. And again and again fell the word, like the ebb of a dying sea. "'Good-bye. Good-bye, Dolly. So long, father. Good-bye, my boy. Always take care of yourself. Good-bye, Mrs. Wilcox. Good-bye." Margaret saw their visitors to the gate. Then she returned to her husband, and laid her head in his hands. He was pitiably tired. But Dolly's remark had interested her. At last she said, "'Could you tell me, Henry, what was that about Mrs. Wilcox having left me Howard's end?' Tranquilly, he replied, "'Yes, she did. But that is a very old story. When she was ill, and you were so kind to her, she wanted to make you some return, and, not being herself at the time, scribbled Howard's End on a piece of paper. I went into it thoroughly, and as it was clearly fanciful, I set it aside, little knowing what my Margaret would be to me in the future." Margaret was silent. Something shook her life in its inmost recesses, and she shivered. "'I didn't do wrong, did I?' he asked, bending down. "'You didn't, darling. Nothing has been done wrong.' From the garden came laughter. "'Here they are at last!' exclaimed Henry, disengaging himself with a smile. Helen rushed into the gloom, holding Tom by one hand and carrying her baby on the other. There were shouts of infectious joy. "'The field's cut!' Helen cried excitedly. "'The big meadow! We've seen to the very end, and it'll be such a crop of hay as never!' Weybridge, 1908-1910 End of Howard's End by E. M. Forster